Well, hello, pair of peeps, and welcome to another episode of Our Haunted Travels Behind the Haunting Live. I am your host, Sean Donnelly. And I'm your co-host, Mary Ann Donnelly. I really got to do something about them titles. <laughs> really. You like them long. <laughs> well, welcome, 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 folks. If you've never been to one of these live streams, these Behind the Haunted Haunting Live streams, you are in for a treat tonight. Tonight we are going to go over a case, and it's going to be some very interesting stuff. Mm-hmm. Yes. Look how excited she is. She's been like, yes! Yeah. I was <laughs> even I was even rereading some of Lizzie's, you know, pre-trial transcripts tonight just because I wanted to get more Lizified. More Lizified. <laughs> more Lizified. That's yeah. a word. It is now. <laughs> All right. So as always, folks, as we are kind of getting things fired up here, all those notifications going out so everyone can come to join the party, here's what we're going to do this time. Instead of telling us where you're from, let us know in chat if you think Lizzie Borden was guilty or not. All right. Do you think that Lizzie Borden did it? Let us know in chat. So, guilty or innocent? Guilty or innocent. All right. What else? Let me bring the chat up. So All right, I can you're see bringing what's going the chat. On. Okay. All right. So, we may have a long one tonight. Just going to let you know. So, if you have to leave and have to go do something else that's perfectly fine we have an open door policy here on our live streams and you can always you, come back yeah, and if you catch it up something. after it's done processing mm -hmm. if you're interested in it and you got something to do it's not a big deal not a big deal at all um so without further ado do we want to do a uh, a roll call as to who's in here uh, we can if you want. We usually don't do that during the... Uh, yeah, we normally don't do that for this, but we right now we're seeing uh, over 16 watching. So uh, those of you who joined us ahead of time, why don't we go ahead and give a little shout out. What do you think? All right. All right. While I make sure I have the right buttons clicked. There we go. <laughs> All there right. We go. So we have... Andrew Kitchens. I thought he was on vacation. I did too. Welcome, welcome, welcome. See, he's like dedicated. Yeah. He wants to know about this Lizzie stuff too. That's right. ATJH Travels, Big T welcome. Coins, DGH Darlington Ghost Hunters, Irish Whiskey 77, JD Night 7, Jeremy's Wild Studio, K Johnson. K Johnson. Everyone say hi to K Johnson. That's my mama, and I'm sure your mama's watching too. There Annette Reagan. So say hi to Annette and K. Right. We also have Crypt Six. Crypt Six in the house. Laura Grimelt. Uh, PSPR Paranormal. PSPR. T Throng or Tracy. All right. And by the way, she said she walked in while uh, I was saying Lizified. Lizified. <laughs> She's like, what hashtag, did I walk into? Hashtag Lizified. Yeah. That sounds like a t-shirt. <laughs> there you go. Uh, uh, we also have Tara, Virtual Ghost Hunt. And virtual Ghost Hunt. Wonder Pup Adventure. All right, folks. So Virtual Ghost Hunt is making an appearance in the chat. And those of you mm -hmm. who are trying to grow your YouTube channel, keep your eye out open for Virtual Go Ghost Hunt because that is a joint channel between us and PSPR Paranormal that we are going to start putting videos out there to help you grow your channel. Okay. So that's why they are here making a debut All for right. the first time, first time in a in. chat. Okay. Pretty awesome. All right. All right. So looking through the chat, uh, we have uh, some guilty verdicts. <laughs> we have, uh, let's see, where was it? Tara says guilty but justifiable homicide. <clears throat> and we have Andrew who says he's in the cat skills right now but says, nah, she's innocent. And then we have uh, K says guilty. Crypt Six says guilty. Uh, 
DGH Darlington Ghost Hunter says, I think she was, so I think that must mean guilty. Uh, I would take that as guilty. You take that as guilty? Okay. Um, Sorry, JD folks, I'm trying Knight to find something on Twitter. Seven says guilty. Laura says guilty. PSPR says guilty. So I think Tracy we're all says pretty guilty. much... I think we're all pretty much <laughs> saying guilty, right? Yeah, pretty much. I think I think uh. Andrew may have been the only right, so, innocent. So let's throw this out there again before we get started. I think we think she was guilty, but we don't think she committed the crime. I well, think you she don't was a think part she, of it. You don't think she did it. I don't it. think she swung the I, axe. I think that she either did it or could have or would, okay. was part of it. Well, I posted it out on Twitter a day ago too, asking, "Do you think Lizzie?" did it okay 64 percent said yes wow and uh 36 percent said no she didn't okay now here's another question that i put out there too is who hasn't heard of lizzie borden because i know there's some people probably in chat right now who hasn't that's okay but we've been to conferences with the younger generations that haven't heard of lizzie borden yeah, and in fact, my students at school, when I go over it every year, they're Who's, like, who? Well, your students at school don't know who O.J. Simpson was. That's true. That's you know, true. That just tells how old we are. That's just <laughs> horrible. In fact, but, yesterday, you know. one of the kids was in, uh, I was doing some work in my room before school started. One of the kids was in, and uh, we had a little chit-chat chit -chat about Lizzie Borden. Oh. Yeah. They, they didn't know that she was acquitted. They didn't know that she was acquitted. No. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they some people think that she was actually convicted. No, she was definitely acquitted. From, yeah, from convicted time. in the eyes of the and of lived, the local jury, and but lived uh, to be a, in a, the real. She lived a, a pretty long life after the yes, acquittal. Too, yeah, she didn't so. die till 1927. Right. Yeah. So well, before we go through our whole presentation, should we start <laughs> going through the presentation? Are we ready to go? I mean, we got 18 people watching now. I think we could go ahead and get rocking and rolling. What do you guys think? I Are think you guys ready to get started? I think they're if ready. you're ready to get started, tell us yes. If you want us to wait a little bit longer, say wait. Who's ready to get rocking and rolling on this case? Because I tell you what, it is some good stuff, folks. Yeah. Hopefully, during this presentation. You're going to hear some stuff that you never heard before. Okay? Mm -hmm. And there is so much stuff out there about Lizzie Borden that is true, not true. And I, and I was reading something earlier today where people are actually writing books. And I forgot the term. I should have wrote it down. They're actually writing books and plays and, and, hey, the Lizzie Borden Chronicles. Yes. That is loosely based on history. It's so not loosely accurately, based that it's, it's not amazing. It's not accurate history. <laughs> but the problem with that is, is future or current, current and future generations are watching that and they think that is what happened. Yeah. You know, we love those, those type of things too. Like national treasure movies and da vinci code and all that stuff it's based off of historical facts but it's not historically accurate okay so lizzie borden is like there's all kinds of stuff yeah, there's out there. so ton. what is true and what's not true yeah tonight's case that we're talking about is going to be based off of court transcripts and police reports mm -hmm. so this is about as accurate as we can get Okay, this is actual court records, testimonies, mm -hmm. the pretrial, all that, and police reports right. to the case. Right. So hopefully you're going to hear something new, and let's see how many people say guilty when we're done. Okay. So you, right. your your idea is to try to change them over to innocent? Well, I asked that second <laughs> question whether she swung the axe or not. I okay. kind of like okay. blew that. Okay. Okay. But. All right. All right. All right. We ready? We're ready. Let's do it. All right. So tonight's case is, did Lizzie use the axe? Mm. See the title? Did Lizzie, did Lizzie use the axe? Did that she axe, actually yeah. do yeah. it? Yeah. You get what I'm saying? I do. All I right. do. Get it? Okay. I do. I get it. All right. <laughs> All right, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. We are live, so there is no editing. 
Yeah, so I'll probably, you know, correct him. Smack me, butt in, whatever, but she's an aficion. Yeah, she's going to correct me several times tonight, so I apologize ahead of time. Also, we are talking about a murder case, folks. So I'm going to give you a warning. We do have the crime scene photos, all right? So when we get to that section, I will say warning. If you want to turn away, you don't want to be offended, hopefully YouTube doesn't flag us or anything like that. But these are crime scene photos that are all over the internet and we are using these photos for educational purposes mm -hmm. okay so i need to throw that out there but it's important that you see the crime scene photos if you haven't seen them yeah and abby's isn't very bad to look at no but mr Andrews gordon is. a little bit all right so hey right now folks please share this out on your social media say we got a great live stream going on over here let's see if we can get some more people to come in here and and join in with us that would be awesome all right so all content being presented eventually will be on the location page for the lizzie borden bed and breakfast which is in panicd.com mm -hmm. Now, the way this works is we will present the story or present the case, and throughout the thing, we'll keep checking with chat, see if you have any questions. We'll try to keep the presentation and chat going as much as possible while one's talking, somebody else will be monitoring, that kind of thing. But at the end, we're going to pose some questions to you, and this is where you guys can get involved, and mm -hmm. we may stop through the presentation and ask you questions, so be alert, yes. be attentive. Yes. All right. Also, we want to ask, we're going to ask a question that once this live stream is done processing, this live stream, the way we do these is we want to keep them out there as videos for documentation purposes. So in order to kind of keep it like a video, we ask that when it's done processing, come back and leave a comment on it afterwards. Then that kind of helps with the logarithm. And we'll pose a question that you can answer in the comments if you can't think of something. So. All right. All right. Now, <clears throat> the first thing I'm going to throw out there, I'm going to pose a question to you guys. Okay. We have written, read, done all kinds of research when it comes to crimes. But mainly it's boiled down to five different reasons why a crime is committed. Okay. So... <clears throat> I want you to keep these in mind as we're going through this. It's either done for money or financial gain, power or prestige, I want to gain power over somebody, revenge or jealousy, passion or rage, they commit that crime in the heat of passion, or, and more currently, <laughs> psychological issues. They just don't know right from wrong. Okay. okay. Um, so that's one of the five reasons a crime is committed. So as we're going through this, kind of think of that as to why somebody would do this. To these two elderly yes. people. Yes. Right. Why would they actually commit this crime? Okay. Sounds good. All right. Everybody with us? We still are. doing good? Yep. We got a few extra people in the mm. house. And, All right. Uh, we're, we're just piling them in. All right, so let's go over the crime. For those who don't know what happened, that's okay. You're going to know here in about two and a half minutes. <laughs> All right, so the actual Cliff crime. Notes version, huh? The Cliff Notes version. The actual crime. <clears throat> On August 4th, 1892, Andrew Borden and Abby Borden were found brutally murdered. Brutally. By means of an axe or hatchet. We believe it was a hatchet. Yes, but the but the <coughs> wonderful nursery rhyme says axe, and it just catches on. It's so it, yeah. it's so much axe easier to good. you know say axe than it is axe to uh, wax. Yeah, it, it does. But we believe it was a hatchet. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now, one thing to mention too: back in those times, hatchet was a tool that everybody had, or had multiple ones, because mm -hmm. you had to chop up your wood for your stove and you know you used it a lot so that was a yes. common tool in yes. a household okay yeah. and that, there were several so. hatchets that they found found the several site. hatchets they took several of them away to see if they were the murder weapon that's right so that's the crime that's what happened now here's the big controversy not controversy but the big 
whatever, why it's so popular, why people so, you know, are so into this is because this crime still, click the wrong button, is unsolved. That's correct. Lizzie, as we said a little bit ago, was acquitted, which means she was found not guilty and no one else was ever brought to trial. Nobody was even charged with it. No. So, yeah, it's an unsolved murder case dating back to 1892. Correct. And it's one of the most famous yes. cases in the United States. Yes. All right, so everybody knows what happened. Mm-hmm. Now's the time where we're putting out the warning. We're going to show you guys the crime scene photos. If you haven't seen them before, like I said, they're all over the internet. So, we having some technical problems? No, just me. I clicked a button. Yeah, hit back. You're watching a video. Hit back. All right, go ahead. You keep on going. I thought I was typing, but apparently yeah. not. That's okay. All right, so here we go. Again, warning. You're going to see some crime scene photos, and hopefully this doesn't flag us and... We'll see what happens. All right. So this is the crime. Now, also, too, <clears throat> I want to mention, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but isn't this, like, the first case where they started taking f uh, crime scene photos? It is one of the first cases. If it's not the first case, it's one of the first cases. It was very uncommon, and people were just like, I think we need to document this. Okay. And uh, it was not something that was standard at all, and it is one of the first if it's not the first. Okay, so keep that in mind as we kind of go over this, and there's a reason why. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Why I say that. Yes. Okay. So this is the uh, where Abby was found. She was upstairs in the guest room. Mm -hmm. Okay. She was making the bed. Okay. Now she would have seen her killer because this is opposite of... The staircase. The, yeah, the staircase and the doorway. So she mm -hmm. would have saw them or heard them come into the room and come around that bed. Correct. Okay. Estimated time of death, and this is important, the estimated time of death was earlier than Andrew's, even though she was found after Andrew. Correct. And that's very important. Now, like I said, this was the first forensic photography or whatever. Pretty much, yeah. She was actually underneath the bed, and they moved the body to take the picture. They moved the bed, actually, as well. Oh, they moved the bed. Yeah. Okay. They moved the body to check her, and then they moved the bed to get a little better view of her, and then they moved the bed like even further to take the pictures, because it would just be a better picture without yeah. that bed in the so way. So that doesn't happen nowadays. You don't no. disturb the crime <laughs> no, scene. No, you do not. Okay? You don't. It's just... Yeah, as a, and remember, I, I use this case in my teaching of my forensic science class, and this is one of the reasons I teach this, is you can't change the crime scene yeah, you just You can't to change the crime scene for the photo. Yeah. Okay, but I think the last thing I have on it, oh, she did receive about 19 wounds instead yeah, of 40. Yes, it was like 19 the, uh, wounds that you can find uh, in the autopsy report. Right. Yes. And... Notice, take note of those shoes. You see those shoes that she's wearing? Don't those look a little strange? Don't that just kind of like not fit the body? Yeah, don't they look a little bit too big? A little bit off. Like she must have had ginormous feet, right? She wasn't a big, tall lady. Okay. Do you want to explain the shoes? Yes, she actually uh, had gout. Mm -hmm. And so those are actually Andrew Borden's shoes. She would wear his shoes when she was having a flare-up so that, you know, there was a little bit swollen. more room in the shoes and it just worked out better. So when she died, she was actually having one of these flare-ups. And so she was wearing now, how Andrew's shoes. how did we shoes. find that out? Like, didn't we ask the tour guide? I'm like, well, that, her shoes, I've always looked mm -hmm. at that picture and it looked weird. What's yeah. up with the shoes? And that's what they told us. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's quite mm -hmm. interesting. All right, so this one's going to get a little... This is the one that's bothering me, this next picture, okay? Because it's a little... Yes. Yeah. So yeah. we're going to go through this quickly. So basically, um, this is a big warning for this one. Yeah, big warning. All right, so this is Andrew. This was downstairs in the parlor. Mm-hmm. Okay, he was basically taking a nap. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, his, he noticed the jacket laying underneath his arm. And so he came home, take a break. He rolled up his jacket just to lay down yeah. and take a nap. Okay. Um, Lizzie, by the way, had this cleaned immediately. Immediately she had yeah. that jacket cleaned, which, again, evidence. Okay. Mm-hmm. He probably didn't know what happened. He was probably asleep. That's the and they, they came up yeah. behind him. So he had 10 to 11 wounds. And they and that is something that they're not sure of, even in the autopsy report, whether or not uh, it was 10 or 11 because it was so mutilated. Yeah. And he was found first by Lizzie. That is correct. Which, if you watched our our uh, teaser about the Lizzie Borden stuff, you heard, what was the words? I'm sorry, I was reading chat. What was your the question? The teaser, where you say, where they said, Maggie... Maggie, come quick. Maggie, come down. Come down quick. Father's, someone's come in and killed father. Yeah, so those were the exact words that, according to Trans- police. Trial, trial transcripts. Trial transcripts and police reports. Yes, Maggie, that she come said, down. Come down quick. Somebody's, somebody's come, come in and, and killed, killed father. father. Okay. Yes. So. That's kind of important. We're going to talk about that here yes. in a little bit. And I know that you've already taken the picture away, but I'm assuming that everybody noticed that he was wearing his shoes. Yes. That's important, too. Yes. Because Lizzie claimed that... that she took them off. That either she or he took them off, and he puts... In, in her uh, pretrial inquisition, she said that he took them off and put on his slippers. Those are clearly not slippers, yeah. and he's clearly not barefoot in that picture either. Yeah, yeah. So now, so that what happened? Was if they got taken well. off, did the photographer put his shoes back on to take the, the picture? The idea is that he was such a man of prestige uh, that he should not be seen without his shoes on. Yeah. So if they were actually off, they p- did put them back on. Okay, how are we doing in chat? Do we need to check in the chat? Uh, there's some things going on. We had a whoa, and uh, glad to see you. So we've got more people in visiting. Um, it's thundering and lightning in Kissimmee, Florida. So they said it's perfect for this story. Yeah, we didn't get the <laughs> we didn't get the lightning and stuff tonight. Yeah, normally we're we're getting rain and thunder and stuff like yeah. that when we do these uh, these events. Um, they think it's interesting about the shoes as well. So, I will leave it at that, and we'll come back to the chat again then later. Are you still reading the chat, double-checking my work? Yeah, Blue Coin (laughs) says, the bed doesn't look like it was moved. I say that caused the picture on the wall. Okay, so um, they actually, they did move it back um, for some of the pictures, but there's actually another photograph of it where literally the bed isn't in the room at all. It's okay. literally right up against the door frame. So it looks like there's no bed in the room for that. Picture. So basically, I think the point that we were trying to make was she was trying to get under the bed. To hide. Okay. And to get when they away. come in to take the picture, they moved the bed mm-hmm. to get her moved into that position that we've all seen in that crime photo and put the bed back. Right. So they disturbed the crime scene. Yes. They also, if you <clears> noticed, <throat> you didn't see her ankles. They they specifically said yeah, that they the did pull the down, dress down as well because it was improper to see the ankles of a lady yeah but that just kind of shows you that the crime scene was disturbed tremendously from the beginning from a forensic standpoint no wonder it's an open case correct okay all right so we ready to move on then yes okay let's do it so let's go over now there are so many different theories and so many different suspects and you know, who did it, how they did it, that, all kinds of stuff. But it all boils down to some very specific suspects. Once you start piecing all the puddles, the puzzles, puddles, <laughs> little, piecing all the puzzles together, okay? Mm-hmm. So let's go over those suspects, all right? Yes. And before you do these suspects, uh, okay, there were yeah, literally... No, no, back. you're fine. I was just going to say, they... They actually have gone through, and there's, like, tons of suspects. Yeah. There are, like, uh, I think there were, like, 120-some su- suspects over the course of the years since the tr- since the actual um, issue, since the murders. Um, these are 
the, the ones most that popular. Then, these yeah, are the ones that, down to yeah. These. yeah. So understand that there are a lot more. These are just the ones that are the most common and the most um, believable. Okay. So first off, you have John Morris. This and is Uncle gonna, John. Uncle John. We're going to do a little profile on him so you know who he is and what was going on. You have Emma Borden, which is uh, Lizzie Borden's sister. Correct. We're going to profile her. Mm -hmm. You have Bridget Sullivan, who was actually the uh, maid or right. the live-in maid for right. the Borden. That everybody called Maggie. Yeah. Uh, you have Dr. Seabury Bowen. There's another one of those names. Yes. Dr. Seabury. <laughs> okay. This was a family doctor. He lived across the street. Then you have William Borden. William Borden is kind of a mystery. Yes. Okay. Whether he even exists. Well. There, whether that is William Borden, we are not 100% right. sure. Yes. That is the only picture that we can find of William S. Borden. And it is lined up in a picture with Mr. Borden. Uh, there is no other documentation that I can find as far as a picture of him. So, I'm hoping that that is his picture. Yeah. That okay. may or may not be. The other ones are all for sure certainties. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll do a little profile on what we know about William S. Borden. Okay, then your number one suspect and the only arrest in the case was their daughter, Lizzie Andrew Borden. She's the number one Lizzie. suspect. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the suspects who potentially could have committed the crime mm -hmm. okay yep all right so let's talk a little bit more how are we doing on chat we doing, doing okay fine all right so let's talk a little bit more about the victims okay just to kind of you guys get a little profile of the victims and their personalities so forth and all that stuff okay so first of all you have andrew borden uh, 1822 to 1892. So he was actually, I think, 69 at the time of his death. Is that, is that? Yeah, that's true. That jives. Yes. Okay. That, yeah. Um, he was a miser, very frugal with his money. Very. Um, and that's true because he basically was poor as a child, and he built his wealth himself and. That was his money, and he didn't want to part with it. Yeah, there, there's, there were a ton of Bordens in the area. Um, there were, I think, it's 38 families of Bordens in the records at this time period, yep. and uh, there, most of them are all related. Fall River, yes, named Borden Street, mm -hmm. and that's not related to these Bordens, right? I mean, right. Bordens were all through Fall River, Fall River, yeah, and they're, they're all related. A lot, they're all related. Um, but they go back generations, and then they kind of big family, big yeah, family. Now family. some of them had money, and others not so much. So let's talk about money, okay? Okay, let's do that. All right. So he built an enormous personal fortune, and what we found is he was estimated worth three hundred fifty thousand dollars in eighteen ninety two. Which equates to seven point seven million dollars in two thousand eighteen. Okay, so he had a lot of money. Yeah, and that's just personal wealth. He was a partner uh, of a company, and that company had uh, equity as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and with all of this money, he really lived properly. Yes. <laughs> Not properly. Properly, he literally didn't have electricity in his house, which already had existed by this point. He didn't have a running water system uh, for a bathroom in his house. They still had. They did you know, have the well in the kitchen. They had the, the well in the well. kitchen, and they had a privy uh, outside, and then they had a um, uh, what do you call that in the basement? Like the, a uh, wash basin. Yeah. The yes. So <coughs> um, they they did have some form of indoor plumbing but it wasn't a real bathroom right. bathroom right yeah um i don't think in this at all i think in tomorrow's video we're going to talk about the house more but we can mention it now the house mm -hmm. the actual house itself yes uh he loved that house loved it. loved it i mean that house was only worth back in that time 
about twenty five hundred dollars, and he paid ten thousand for Correct. it because he wanted that. He wanted house. that house, yes. So that's kind of important to know. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> he apprenticed as a furniture and coffin maker. Yes, You'll a lot of often... people and a lot of reports say that he was actually. Um, some of the, the movies and shows and stuff said he was a uh, mortician, mortician, basically. But he wasn't. Yeah, they said he was an undertaker. He was not an undertaker. Um, he, however, did make coffins. He made coffins. Yeah. So as the furniture maker, maker, that's what he he was. That's why he was tied to that idea. Yeah. Okay. He sat on the boards of several different banks. I mean, several. When I say several, I'm talking like maybe six. I didn't list all of them, but you know. That takes some money to do that. Mm -hmm. And he had many rental properties. Many. Many different houses that he owned and businesses that he owned um, that were rental properties. So basically he started out as that coffin maker, furniture maker, and then he kept putting his money back into buying properties and doing things like that. And he built up this tremendous wealth. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which... By doing that, he had many, many enemies. Yeah, he kind of irritated some people. There were people yeah. that would come to the house and want to rent from rent, you know, on his properties, and he would decide whether he thought that that was a viable business or not. And if he didn't think so, he wouldn't let you know them them rent from him. Right. So some people weren't happy with that. They're like, "But but you worked up to this. You should understand." And he didn't want to have anything to do with it. So let's talk about Abby Borden a little bit, okay? Yes. All right. So Abby Borden, she was, uh, say, 1828 to 1892, mm -hmm. okay? This is Andrew's second wife. Correct. She is not the mother of any of his children. No. They did not have any children together. That's uh, Emma and Lizzie's stepmother. Correct. <clears throat> um but she was starting around the time of the the crime. Okay, I'm not saying the M word. I've already five, stepped on it. But yeah, five years before yeah. is when it's she started to receive. She started to re receive properties from Andrew. Like he started putting them in her name, and her family's name. You know that kind of thing. And that started, off yeah, Lizzie that started a so little bad. turmoil <laughs> in the boarding house. Yeah, Lizzie and that. Emma were not happy with that at all. And uh, this eventually leads to um, Mr. Borden giving Lizzie and Emma a, a house of their own uh, that was a, rel you know, their grandfather's house yeah. uh, on Ferry Street. Eventually, he buys that back off of the girls. Yeah, they weren't happy um, with that. that. Yeah, it wasn't a big great thing but there are questions as to whether at the time of the death he was actually in transfer of one of the estates to abby borden's name yeah um okay so let's uh keep going mm -hmm. uh, she still performed some of the household household chores even she though her husband was quite wealthy she still and she had a maid yeah her job was <laughs> to run the house that's right um so the night or the the day of the murders, basically she was up making up the bed because John Morris stayed there the night before. Mm -hmm. So she went up herself to do that. Yeah, and that earlier even that morning, she was using a feather duster dusting all over down down on the first floor while Andrew was talking with John Morris. You know, she was going in and out dusting with a feather duster. So yeah. she was dusting the downstairs, and then she went up and she's making the bed and cleaning up the room upstairs. And you're like, really? You have a maid? Yeah. Uh, some say that she was extremely strict on the girls, while others report that she was kind and nurturing. Okay? There is, uh, in some of the uh, testimony, I don't know, did we put that in the timeline? What's Where that? Lizzie had told somebody, made a comment about her stepmother? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Yeah. So there's a lot of people out there that says she was abusive and he was abusive and stuff like that. But none of that is in the, the police trial reports or the trial or transcripts anything, or anything no. like that. No. So that could be some of that made up stuff. Okay. I'm there are, saying. there are some things that kind of lead you to believe it could be possible. Some theories and stuff like that, but it never possible. came out during the trial. But no, it did not. Yeah. They just, 
they didn't talk about those types of things in those days anyway. So even if it did happen, <clears throat> it probably wouldn't have shown in, in there. But we're basing all of our information off those yeah, trial transcripts. Off the okay, now this is important to know. She was actually, and there's the M word, murdered first but found last. That's important to know, and we'll explain why here in mm -hmm. a minute. Um, and uh, Lizzie stopped calling her mother in 1887. Yes, that was the year of the uh, transfer of <laughs> some of the properties to some of Abby's family. And that's pretty much why is because they thought that she was a gold digger. She was trying to take all of her father's money. Yes. And, and she didn't deserve it. Emma and Lizzie lived with their we father. We deserve it. How old was Emma? Emma uh, was, I believe, 42 at the time of the deaths. Yeah. So they both still lived at home. Yeah. Uh, Neither one of them dad. was married. All right. So how are we doing here in chat? Uh, pretty Are decent. you guys with us so far? Everything making sense? Do we have any questions so far? They wanted to know what happened to um, the first wife. Okay. Uh, she died. Um, and uh, she died when Lizzie was about two and a half years old. And she was ill. And um, that's what happened to her. Um, they, the idea... Um, I'm not mistaken. She had like Chat pneumonia Chat is awful something. quiet. Did we yeah. lose everybody? Well, they were listening so <laughs> intently. Um, they they think that she had some sort of a, a uterine problem or a or a spinal sort of disease or um, just varied things like that or pneumonia. Or they're not real clear on exactly what happened to her, but. Um, you know. So Tracy says she's still here taking it in. Yes. Audrey Summerline says none of it makes sense. None of it makes sense. Um, by the way, he married his first wife on Christmas <clears throat> Day, by the way. So just throw that out there. It's just a little tidbit, you know. Okay, so everyone's intently listening. So we still have people with us. That's, that's good. We haven't, <laughs> we haven't lost viewers. Huh. No, they're just really <laughs> focused. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. So that kind of goes over the victims. Now we're going to go over the suspects, just so you guys kind of know. A little bit of who they were. A little bit more about who they are. All right. So let's do that now. Our first one, by the way, is the most creepiest picture. <laughs> and I got a story about that picture. Yes, right you do. Yeah. All right, so we stayed, when we went to the Lizzie Borden house, we stayed, they call it the John Morris room. It was the guest room. The room That's where the Abby room was where found. Abby was found. Mm -hmm. We stayed in that room, okay? I was there laying in bed trying to relax, chill out. You know, we drove there from uh, Providence. Providence that morning. We got there, did the tour. Afternoon, went and got Well, okay. See, told you she'll correct me. Afternoon. We rented a car that day, too. So we rented a car, went through all that, drove down there, took the tour, went to dinner, you know, all this other stuff. So by the end of the day, I'm a little, I'm trying to relax. I'm looking up, and what I'm looking up trying to relax is that picture right there, hanging on the wall, dead, staring dead at me. Dead center across the wall on the other side, yes, just staring at you. Just staring at me, like going, go ahead, go to sleep. I dare you. Go ahead, you. I dare you, <laughs> just go to sleep. Yeah, so yeah. that was that was one of those nights where like I went to sleep by passing out, pretty <laughs> yeah. much. So, anyways, John Morris was the younger brother of Sarah. It was Sarah, Andrew's mm -hmm. Sarah's first brother. wife. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, 1833 to 1912, he was born in Fall River, but he didn't live in Fall River. No, not at the time of the murders. Okay, so he was actually. Emma and Lizzie's uncle. uncle. Mm -hmm. Okay, Uncle John. Yes. Um, now, this is interesting. He was a butcher by trade. His trade was he was a butcher. Wait mm. a second. Let me do this. Let me do this. His trade was he was a butcher. Did you get that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
He had some real estate dealings with Andrew. He did, and he, he did. was hoping for more. Mm-hmm. He arrived unannounced on August 3rd to the house. That is true. There is That's kind of strange because there is that didn't docu- happen back then. Right. There's some documentation that said that um, Andrew had actually sent a, no- a, a letter to him asking him to come and visit in Fall River uh, to talk about some things. But that was a couple weeks before that, so he didn't announce that he was going to show up then. He yeah, just he kinda just kind of like showed, showed up. up. And what's even more exciting is he shows up to spend the night, doesn't bring any luggage, doesn't bring any bags, just comes with the clothes he has on. and you know. Yeah, just shows up, hey, I'm spending the night. Yeah. Kind of interesting. All right. He actually stayed in the room where Abby was found. We already said that and covered that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that was their guest room. Mm-hmm. And he had a very strange alibi. You but could the court say that. accepted it. Do you want to talk about his alibi? So, on the day of the murders, he uh, was going out to visit some of his relatives. Um, and he left and he went and visited them. And then when he came back, he decided to come back by streetcar. When he left, he went on foot and he walked to these locations uh, for the visits. But then when he was coming back, he says, you know, I'm just going to take the streetcar. And he remembered the exact streetcar number he was in. He remembered the badge number of the drivers. He, he remembered the, the priests that were on the uh, on the tra- on the trail with him. He knew the times. He knew the trolley numbers. He knew all of those specific things. So when he was questioned, bu- 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 bu, he rattled it off, and they're like, "Oh, okay. Well, this this guy knew where he was." Mm-hmm. And his story never changed. No. So that made it more helpful. And even better, okay, he was born in Fall River. Mm -hmm. He had family that he went and visited in Fall River. Mm -hmm. After the crimes, he never returned back to Fall River. Right. There are no reports. And he moved to Iowa pretty close. To the Villisca Axe Murder location. Axe Murder location. And in fact, because of his involvement with the Lizzie Borden uh, murder trial here and the killings of uh, Andrew and Abby, when the Velisca Axe murders happened, they actually looked at him as potentially being the Velisca Axe murderer. Yeah, he was a suspect. But they realized, oh, wait, he's already dead. He's in the cemetery yeah. already, so when it's that not happened, him. He already passed away. But did he Isn't know? Isn't that amazing, Did though? he know the people who did it? Did they get tips from him? Did he talk about it? Who knows? Okay. Let's move on, shall we? Let's do that. Okay. Our next one is Emma Borden, the sister of Lizzie. Lizzie. Mm-hmm. Okay. She also lived in the house. Correct. All right. 1851 to 1927. She attended Wheaton College. I didn't. I don't know if you updated that. Did Lizzie go to college? I don't know. She did not. She yeah. actually dropped out of high school. She dropped out of high school. Yes. Okay. So she was uh, well educated. She was an older sister and took care of Lizzie. Meaning, when their mother died, she was the older sister, and she took care of Lizzie, which kind of her mother. She kind of rubbed against Abby a little bit because she was the motherly type. Yes. Her Lizzie. mother had asked her to watch over Lizzie and take care of Lizzie, and she promised her mother on her mother's deathbed that she would always take care of Lizzie. Yeah. And so she vowed that she was going to do that for their lives. That also come, becomes important, too. Right, right. She was not home at the time of the murder. She was staying um, with some friends uh, she, that just had a baby. Yes. So she had left and gone out there, and that's where she was at the time of the murders. Mm-hmm. But she did receive half of the inheritance. It split between her and Lizzie. Lizzie mm-hmm. Which is important to know. She also lived with Lizzie until 1905. And both she and Lizzie died in 1927, just a couple months apart. Lizzie died yeah. first, and then Emma died. A so bit in later. 1905, they had a falling out. Falling out. Okay. Now all their lives they've lived together, but in 1905. Oh, sorry. 
Okay. <laughs> Jumping ahead. It's okay. Okay. So af- at 19 o- in 1905, they had this falling out, and they never spoke to each other again. No. Never. They didn't write letters back and forth. They 27? just So broke 22 off. years? They broke never, off communications. Never, never spoke to each other yes. again. Yes. And Emma was very timid. I mean, the whole trial and and all the press and all that stuff was really just getting to her like really bad now neither one of them were married no did they even date is there any records of dating or anything courtship there's not there's nothing listed um lizzie (sighs) was not interested in dating uh, at all she didn't want to get married she had no desire to ever be married she had no desire to ever have children um emma on the other hand um would not have been opposed to it let's just put it that way Okay, but that story in the um, Chronicles about her being engaged and Lizzie doing, you know. Yeah, no, that's, no, that's, that's, that's all. That's all made up. There yeah. is nothing actually um, documented that she, because in the Chronicles that shows that she had a baby at one time. Uh, there's nothing documented anywhere that shows that. And in fact, some of the. Um, you know, they have ripperologists. We could be Lizzieologists, I guess. Um, the people who really, like, this is their life's thing. They do this constantly. They've done research and, and tried to figure this out. And there was somebody who actually said that they found documentation that, you know, there was this person who um, they grew up thinking that they had this Aunt Emma and Aunt Lizzie and it turned out that it was really Emma's daughter and all this stuff. But other people said that doesn't jive. Like they they tore it apart basically and yeah. said it didn't work. When the dates, dates and stuff, and times and dates and, and locations where they were and everything. Some yeah. of those stories that come out. Since this is such a well known case, well researched, everybody's digging in this. There are several different Lizzie Borden websites with all the. C- conspiracy theories and all this other stuff there's so much out there that's why we wanted to do this based off of the court transcripts and the the police reports right just so you guys kind of know the base of actually what happened right who these people are and i and i did a lot of the a lot of genealogy studies obviously as if you saw the videos earlier this week um trying to piece together who was related to who and how and and in none of that is there anything that that really seems to show or indicate that she had any children Okay, so our next suspect was Bridget Sullivan. Maggie. They Maggie. called her Maggie. Uh, 1869 to 1948. She mm-hmm. lived in 1948. She, uh, she was Borden's live-in maid beginning in 1889. And thank you, by the way, for putting these dates in. You're there. welcome. Um, they called her Maggie. Now, this is an interesting little story of why they called her Maggie. They always called her Maggie instead of Bridget, and that really ticked her off. But the maid that they had before Bridget came in, her name was Maggie. And they were both Irish immigrants. So that's just, they just kept calling her Maggie. Maggie, do this. Maggie, do this. Maggie, come here. Maggie, do this. Maggie, time for breakfast, whatever. And she's like, my name's Bridget. Yeah. You know, but they just kept calling her Maggie. They didn't care. Yeah. They always just called her Maggie. So that kind of tells you, like, how they thought about the help, so to speak. She wasn't important enough to learn her name. Yeah. Yeah. But... Interesting enough, she was the last to see Mrs. Borden alive. She was the last one to see her alive because Mrs. Borden told her, hey, go clean the windows. Go outside and clean. Mm -hmm. You know, she was in charge of the house. We're getting the house cleaned up. So she gave her some direction. Um, She was outside cleaning the windows during uh, Mrs. Borden's murder. Then at some point, you want to explain this a little bit? Sure. Um, she actually, and we're going to go over this more in the timeline when we go over the timeline of what went down. But she was outside during during Mrs. Borden's murder, upstairs cleaning the windows. But Mr. Borden's, which happened how much time later? Uh, well, between an hour, hour and a half later. Okay. It's, it's a window of about a she half hour She was upstairs way. laying down. Now, that gets a little bit confusing. But basically... Everybody in the house was not feeling well 
And that was because Mr. Borden was such a Grinch, he wouldn't let them make new food until all the other food had been eaten. So they were probably eating like two, three day old mutton. Mm -hmm. And back then they used to call it summer sickness, which basically was food poisoning because they had no refrigeration. Okay. We've, we've talked about this before with the Sealy Rose case and some of the other ones. So he was like, you're not throwing that out. You know, we, we'll, we'll eat that again. So they were all, you know, they, they had summer sickness. It was basically food poisoning. So Bridget, same way. She wasn't feeling good. She's out. This is August 4th. Yes. She's out in the sun cleaning the windows, and she had to go upstairs and lay down. Yeah, and the so. temperature was um, in the upper seven, the upper 70s. They always say that it was, oh, it was the hottest day on record. You know, it was so hot. Um, the if. If you go by the Fall River Daily News report, um, the temperature was 78. Yeah, it was a warm. So it was day a warm with day, the sun out, but it wasn't the hottest. But day. it wasn't the hottest. Yeah. Now we don't know what the percentage of the humidity was, and that could greatly impact this. But um, it was summertime, and you know they got their milk out on the doorstep, and yeah, sitting out. you know they ate this <sighs> two, three day old mutton. You know it, it's. All right, so after the trial, not after the, the, the crime, but after the trial was over, she left town and moved to Montana, got married, and never returned to Fall River again. She, again, like Emma, was not happy with all the turmoil and exposure to the press and all that stuff like that. She just wanted to get away. But she never returned again to Fall River. This is the interesting part, and you guys really need to, if you're taking notes, jot this down. How does a teacher say that? <laughs> how, how do teachers do that? If you're write taking this notes, down. Write this down. All right. <laughs> On her death. Here, you explain this because you explain it better. Okay. About the note on her deathbed. We learned about this on the tour. We did. Um, so when she was... Um, thought anyway that she was on her deathbed and she was sick and she wasn't going to make it she sent for some of her family members to come to her bedside um they didn't live in town so they it took them a while to get there but she sent for them and said i have some information that i need to to get out before i die about a big secret she gets better before <laughs> she uh she tells the gets secret. these people to her bedside, and so by the time they come, there, she's like, eh, "Maybe it's not so much that I tell you now. I'm gonna be okay." Yeah. So then she did pass away and never passed on that secret. Right. Um, now there are some people that that indicate in some books you can find that she did and did tell that secret, uh, and that it was that she lied on the stand to help Lizzie. Other people say, no, she never told the secret. So who, who are we who going knows? to know unless one of her family members actually wrote it down somewhere because she certainly didn't. That's so right. did she give the secret? We don't know. Do you want to talk about the, uh, this next one? Because you know a little bit more than I do why he's considered a suspect <laughs> he would be a, a good suspect no uh so basically he was the family doctor from across the street he discounted um abby's feeling that they were being poisoned by someone he said it's it's fine it's just a little food poisoning or, or summer sickness but you're gonna be fine nobody's trying to poison you um, Let me stop you there for a second. You said Abby Borden, right? Because Abby did. Borden did go to. Is that in the timeline? Yes. Okay, and we're gonna we'll we'll mention we'll it again repeat then. it again. Mm -hmm. but, but Abby Borden went across the street to the doctor because they were like really really sick. Yeah, so they she were went throwing doctor, up and vomiting. And she's like somebody's trying to poison us, whatever. Like you said, no, it's just summer sickness, whatever. Andrew got ticked off about that. He's like, I'm not paying his bill. Mm -hmm. You're like yelling at Abby, like, don't go over there. Yeah, 
Don't because then he not only did she go over there, he came over to the house then to the boarding to house check to on check them. on them, and he's like, and "This is not off. acceptable." Yeah, he's like, "I'm not paying for a doctor bill." Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Mr. Scrooge. Yeah. So after mm-hmm. the murders, um, he is basically the first person that gets to the scene. Uh, to actually examine the bodies. He's the first person besides Lizzie and, of course, Bridget to see the bodies. Um, Everybody else to that point was just hanging out in the kitchen, soothing um, Lizzie, and he's the first one that gets to the scene and actually views the body. So he's the first in the actual crime scene room. Um, He actually pronounces both Andrew and Abby as being dead. Uh, He is the first doctor to see Abby when she is murdered as well, or when she's found as well. He seems to be a little bit close to Lizzie, too. When they were out of town, when the Bordens were out of town, uh, he was actually seen in public taking Lizzie without an accompaniment to church. And that was a no-no. You don't go someplace alone with a man. I don't care if it is church. You just don't do that. And so they did not have a chaperone. They were unaccompanied. And that was just crazy talk. Yeah. You know, so they, they had a closeness. He leaves the house during the um, wait for the police. He supposedly runs across the street to go home and checks the rail uh, schedule to see, you know, if he's going to be able to get Emma back, you know, today. Uh, And once he checks the rails, then he goes off to send a telegram to Emma saying, you've got to come home now. There's a problem. Come home. So let and me back while up he's just, out, let me just back up. So you got you know, write this down. He enters the crime scene, then leaves the crime scene before the police arrive and goes and does these things. Yes, that's important. Kind of like yeah, the so idea he was there is, and then he left. Yes. So I guess it, it's more conjecture on on my part. Uh, if I throw this out there, but he left the crime scene. Did he take away from the crime scene any items that seem to not be there right. <laughs> later? Because yeah. there were several. Yeah. There were several things that just disappeared. That doesn't happen today. No. You know, that doesn't happen. So, um, and then you said he sent the telegram yes. to Emma. Mm-hmm. One thing that we didn't mention when we went over the case okay the crime normally something like that now just imagine the crime scene you would think that there were footprints or some other type of tracking of fluid through that house or you know in out the door area whatever there wasn't Mm mm-hmm there was none found. There was no breaking, you know, like somebody broke in found. There was nothing. It was, everything was right where they were found. Even splattering. There wasn't a lot of splattering or anything like that. It was, everything was self-contained. So, if it was cleaned up, somebody would have to have some knowledge on how to do that. Mm-hmm. Just throwing that out there, okay? <laughs> Just throwing that out there. All right, so here we go to this gentleman who's quite interesting. All right, I'm going to let you talk about him, too, because I I don't know. I didn't even know that he existed, to be honest with you. Well, I did find in the genealogy, I did find a William S. Borden. So okay, he you, did, so you did find him he in did the actually he exist. So he did exist. He did actually exist. All right? Um I didn't put in here his birth dates and death dates. That's okay. We had a couple others. Okay. Okay. Um, There is a question 
uh, as to whether or not he was actually Andrew Borden's son. So if you've watched any of the movies that have come out over time about Lizzie Borden, sometimes they mention this potential half-brother. Mm-hmm. Um, this would have been him. And uh, he was actually a Borden because it was a relative's wife that he was supposedly having this affair with that made William. Okay? So... Is that really true? We don't really know. We don't know very much about him. There are some people who had difficulties in um, being given permission to see his um, birth certificate. um, And they say that that only happens when there is an an illegitimacy. So that kind of throws more on that fire that says, was he? Or wasn't he really that woman's husband's kid? Was it possible that it really was Andrew's son? So we don't know for sure. Um, There's not really anything specific that says that he did have this child with him um, or with her. But um, she was married at the time. So, you know, whatever. Um, All right. So in addition to that, uh, William Borden was supposedly somebody who generally had an axe that he kind of kept with him uh, in his carriage, underneath the seat cushion. He'd always seem to have this axe with him. And um, he eventually hangs himself. So in 1901, he hangs himself. Okay, so go back, and bring up, up here. He hangs himself in 1901 not that long you know about nine years later does that have anything to do with the murder well possibly there's an individual named henry hawthorne um, that said that there was a time during this time period where william was extremely intoxicated and he started having a conversation with his axe and in this conversation... It's going to happen to you when you get older. It is. A, you, know, you think you, you, you hear about the older women with all their cats and stuff. <laughs> no, Marianne's going to be sitting out on the front porch rocking, talking to her ass. I can see it. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> Anyways. It's, a, it's okay, precious. It's okay. <laughs> Anyways, while he's having this conversation with his axe, he's overheard as saying, You knew my father. And that fat sow that he married. He should have married my mother. Of course you knew them. You were there when they died. So, it is is interesting that he's having this conversation while he's intoxicated. So, he's either just out of his gourd while he's intoxicated, or he is becoming loose-lipped while he's intoxicated. We don't know. But he he is listed as having said this conversation, had this conversation with his ex. All right, so let's ask a question out here in the chat. Have you heard anything new yet that you already... That you didn't know. If you did, let us know in chat. Yeah. We're going to take just a little break, and we want to hear your responses. Let us know if if you're hearing anything new relating to this case. Yeah, so there was somebody I saw a little while ago say that they were having flashbacks to history class. (laughs) That's because I I think I was, when I was saying, write this down. Maybe. Um, And then uh, there was somebody who uh, reminded me of an old nursery rhyme. Remember the peace porch hot, peace porch cold, peace porch in the pot nine days old. Kind of reminded them of uh, the mutton item. Uh, So that was kind of exciting. I wonder if that was the first murder scene that the doctor had seen. As far as murder, probably. (laughs) It was, you know, he wasn't that old um, for being a doctor already. And, um, you know, it was a quiet town. The other murders that are similar, did it happen Mm -hmm. before this one or during the trial? I don't remember. Right before the trial. It was like a week before the trial. Okay. So we'll, we'll talk, talk about, about that, that later. another yeah. day. Yes. <clears throat> that, that is actually on the after or during the trial. That's next week. Um, but anyhow. <laughs> so Anya says new to her. 
So everyone saying hello to each other. Nice, awesome. Nice. Awesome. Hello, Good hello. to know each other. And we have Bridget Kohler. Happy trails hiking. Bridget, all, all kinds of Bridget, new. when we say Bridget did it, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> Bridget did this and Bridget did that. <laughs> it's not you. <laughs> you didn't have to clean the windows. You didn't have to make breakfast. <laughs> all right. So Monica. Knew the basics. That's uh, yes. Michael's. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Michael's wife. I know. Knew the basics, but most of it's new. Mm-hmm. All right, so All right. let's move on to dun, 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 Lizzie. Lizzie. <laughs> All right, so here's her profile, 1860 to 1927. Mm -hmm. Okay, she's the youngest daughter of Andrew and Sarah Borden. She was at the house the day of the murders. Definitely was home mm -hmm. when it happened. She was a Sunday school teacher. Yes. Yes, she was. And that's one of the things that kind of during her trial is, you know, works on her behalf. Yeah. This, this little Sunday How school teacher Sunday school would teacher never. She, she couldn't do that, you know. Yeah. She's just this little Sunday school teacher. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. She is a known, or was, not is, she's not with us anymore. She was a known kleptomaniac. She was caught several times. Yes. However, I want to talk about that just for Daddy a second. Daddy just took care of it. That's right. Daddy took care of it. She had money. She would go and buy a dress. Oh, I want this little bauble too. She'd just take <laughs> it. Okay. And then all the shopkeepers in town and Andrew knew this. They just put it on his bill. Okay. But later in life... After the trials and after she moved away and all that other stuff like that, she was arrested in Providence, Rhode Island for shoplifting. Yeah, because Daddy wasn't there to take Daddy care of it Daddy wasn't anymore. there. So was this just a habit of hers or was she a true kleptomaniac? Mm -hmm. It's hard to, hard to say. Hard to say. I think it was just she just did it. You know, It's like, oh, you mean you can't just take that stuff and send me a bill? <laughs> you know? I don't know. I think she just would do things like that just to see if she could get away with it. Right. Well, that could be, too. She was very stubborn and very spoiled. She was definitely her father's daughter. Mm -hmm. Very, what's the word? I, I guess I'll say bullheaded. She, there you go. She wanted it her way, and that's how it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. The color of the house the, yes. that the house was painted in the day was her decision. Yes, she actually chose that color. Chose the color for that house. In early 1892 as well. As well. It was right. literally freshly painted, basically, of her choosing. And Andrew knew that. He's like, I, I don't care. Let Lizzie decide. And the original paint that they came, she's like, no, that's not the right shade. But No, try again. <laughs> they brought the paint to the house in the barn. She goes, out, no, that's not right. Changing it. That's like just, it. you know, and that's documented. That's just her personality, how she was. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> her alibi changed constantly, constantly throughout the police questioning, the preliminary trial, the grand jury, her trial and everything. It was constantly changing. It was never the same. However, it is true that Dr. Bowen kept her drugged. She was drugged throughout that whole entire time on morphine to keep her relaxed and calm, supposedly. Or was it to keep her quiet? Yeah. Who knows? But she was definitely drugged. When From she was testifying for herself on her trial, she was so high on morphine that, you know... There's a, there's a statement in the thing, and it's been in the movies, and there's like, I don't even know who your name. Mm -hmm. I don't even know who you are. Yeah, that's the in the Inquisition testimony. That's a true statement, because she was just, woo. Yeah, and, and, in, and generally in all the movies, when she's being interrogated, they ask her a whole bunch of questions, and she's saying uh, conflicting things, and they bring that to her attention, and she's like, I don't even know what I said. I have yeah, said, I you've remember. you've asked me so many questions, I don't know what I've said. Well, yeah. If it was the truth, do you really need to worry about what you said before? Just say the same so thing. So like we said before, she was the only one that was ever charged with the crime. Mm -hmm. Okay. And after the trial, she was acquitted. Yes. 
Now, what I find, and okay, I'll finish this. She inherited half the money. So the inheritance was split between her and Emma. Now, what I find totally amazing that kind of just I don't understand, okay? Mm -hmm. Fall River, I think it was a population of around 120,000, I think. I don't know that answer. I, I think that's what I saw. Or maybe that's a population <laughs> now. I don't know. But it was where they lived, it was a small, like, suburb, like a small thing of Fall River. Like, everybody knew everybody. Okay? And she associated with the people Most that people lived up did, on the hill. Yeah. So she knew everybody in church and school and all this other stuff. But after this was over and all the national press and everybody who kind of looked at her like, ah, no, she just did it. She stayed in Fall River. She stayed there mm -hmm. and just dealt with it. It's like, because I think she loved being there, but number two, she was stubborn, you know, and she was <laughs> like, hey. Now, here's an interesting fact, too. When she passed away, she stated in her will she wanted nobody at her funeral. Nobody was there. She didn't want anybody there. So she did. She was bitter. Okay. So that's kind of sad. But why stay there? You know? She could have went anywhere. She had the money. She could have moved overseas, a different country or something. She could have but definitely moved But she was nationally recognized, probably worldwide recognized because her photo was out everywhere. But she just said, I'm staying here. I don't care. Whatever. The kids yeah. made fun of her and walking down the street and all that other stuff. Yeah, they definitely would torment her. <clears throat> yeah, I don't think I could have said. Life. So here's a question in chat. After going through all that and all the national recognition and, and all that stuff, would you have stayed there? Would you have stayed in that town or would you move on and try to start over? What would you have done? Let us know in chat. Yeah. Let us know. I think most people today that go through this type of thing, they actually do move away. You yeah. know, when, whenever I'm doing any of the cases in my, in my class, uh, I always like to look up uh, that year and see if there's any new information about that person, where they are now and, you know, things like that. And uh, they generally, if they're, if they're not in prison or, or, you know, anything like that, if they've been released or if they got acquitted, they move. <laughs> they don't stick around. Um, and yes, out of body, they, they gen generally change their names. She kind of did, but not exactly. She changes it eventually to Lisbeth instead of Lizzie. Yeah, she did change her name. Legally. She changed her name legally to Lisbeth. Mm -hmm. uh, she did do some traveling. You know, yeah, she, she went to the 1893 the World's Fair. That's right. She was at the World's Fair. Yeah. yeah. Um, but... She bought Maple Croft with her, which we'll be covering next week, with mm -hmm. her uh, sister, and they lived there. And uh, Maple Croft, by the way, is not too far from their final resting place, mm -hmm. which we'll cover the week after. And it is currently just been purchased this year so Hell Kitten, by Hell the people Kitten who own the Lizzie asking, Borden Bed and Breakfast. Okay, well, Hell Kitten is asking, did they stay in the house where it happened? For a little while. Yeah, for a little while. Eventually, they bought Maplecroft and moved yeah. to the Hill Big Mansion. We're going to cover that. Yeah, next it was week. like five to seven weeks after her trial was completed that they purchased Maplecroft and moved out. Um, but prior to that, Emma stayed in that house. Af right after the trial, Emma and Lizzie stayed in that house. Um, so, yeah. yeah, they did. Okay, so Out of Body is asking who got the house after the murder. All right, so tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow's Friday. Tomorrow's mm -hmm. video uh, coming out will go over the timeline of owners of the house. And they did keep it for a little while. Did you just say that? They kept it for a little while as a rental, but then they eventually... I didn't say that. It. I said they lived there. But yes, they did keep it for a while after they moved to Maplecroft and they used it as a rental facility. Yeah. Uh, so the, the sisters actually inherited it after the murder. Yeah, so tomorrow's video goes through the building of the house, 
all the way to the current owners, mm-hmm. the history part of it. So mm-hmm. it explain it's changed hands several times. It's e- it was even a business at one time. So So Hell Kitten <clears throat> says, Eek, nope, I'd be gone. Hell Kitten, you stay with us because you're gonna really creep out in a little bit when I tell you something else. <laughs> yeah. All right. So at this point, folks, I mean we still have twenty seven of you guys with us. Thank you, thank you, thank mm-hmm. you. I mean, no, we're dragging I mean it seems a little bit I don't know. Maybe you're interested in this because everyone's staying with us. I mean, we are like, we love this case. I Mary love it. And like I'm sorry. Static. I have so much detail <laughs> that I cut out like a lot yeah, of we detail. We really cut this down to kind of like keep going. We've been streaming now for an hour and 14 minutes. Wow. What we're going to do next is go through the timeline of the crime as, as detailed as we possibly could so that you guys can kind of know a little bit more about what transpired and took place. All right, over the next well, couple weeks now, we have more stuff that relates to this. We got a video, like uh, tomorrow I said, is, the, is we talk about the location video, our visit there and the history of the building. Uh, Saturday, we're going to go over more ghost stories and folklore about the building. Then we're flipping it just a little bit where we're going to cover Maplecroft the following week, the house that they moved to. There's paranormal reports there. Mm -hmm. But we have a video coming out about the nursery rhyme. We have a video coming out about the dining room in this house, which... It's good. Oh, man. (laughs) That's going to be interesting. Uh we got the ghost stories and folklore about Maplecroft, and we got some other videos. Not next Thursday. Next Thursday is going to be Lizzie Borden's meatloaf recipe. The following Thursday night, we're going to be here, and I'm going to be interviewing Lizzie Borden. <laughs> we're going to be asking about some of the stuff that was non admissible during the trial. And we're going to be questioning her and find out some more stuff. But let's move on. Are we ready to move on? Are we ready? That was like the seventh inning stretch. Yeah. Um, oh. Well, be- right before you do that, uh, okay. FS Paranormal looked up for us. Uh, the Fall River uh, Census in 1900 said that there are 104,863 in individuals in okay. 1900. So pretty pretty close pretty to 100,000 approximately then. And then they're all just saying it's such an interesting story and they love the details. So. Yeah, the, the recipe video is actually Lizzie Borden's meatloaf recipe that Marianne's yes. going to be doing. Yes. So. Yeah. All right. And they like watching me get excited. <laughs> <laughs> At all least right. I haven't creeped them all Are out too much yet. <laughs> yeah. Back's starting to twinge, but all right, we're pushing On with through. the show. On with the show. On with the show. Here we go. Let's go over this timeline. And I think this starts on August 2nd. So this mm-hmm. is two days before the crime. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Two days before. Andrew mentions trouble at home. Home to associates of his. Yes. He says there's things going on at home. You know, poor Andrew with all the <laughs> women at the house. So you much know, estrogen. Yeah. All them women at the house are just bickering like a bunch of old hens. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And... They start to get sick. Yeah. This is when they start getting sick. Remember we said they went across the street to see Dr. Bowen, that summer sickness that was yeah. started so on Yeah, so Mr. and Mrs. Borden are vomiting a ton on the second. And Bridget, though, isn't. And they're like, well, why is Bridget not sick? Yeah. Lizzie tells her friend Alice Russell on the 3rd that she did not vomit on the 2nd. She did not vomit. That Lizzie did not? She she tells Alice that she didn't. Okay. According to the court transcripts from Alice when she uh, was on the stand. So then... Um, it's the, on you right now. I thought you were talking. Oh, no, that's okay. So um, then... So we're moving to the third. Now. Third, yeah, because okay. the second's kind of boring. So <laughs> we just have a lot of vomiting. Okay, a lot know. of vomiting. A lot of vomiting. Just vomit. Yeah. All right. So the third. <laughs> All right. This is the day before. This is the day before. So they get up. They're still not feeling well. Do you want this clicker? No, it's all right. That's okay. okay. You just you just go right ahead. So still not feeling well, 
And so Abby decides she's going across the street to talk to Dr. Bowen. And so we had mentioned this a little bit ago. He eventually comes over, uh, says, you know, it's not, you're going to be fine. You're not being poisoned. And Mr. Borden is just livid that he has come over to check on them. Then between 10 and 11.30, Lizzie allegedly attempts to purchase prussic acid from Eli Bentz uh, at the Smith's Pharmacy. All right, you got to talk about that yes. for a second. Because that's the first time that came up. Lizzie claims she doesn't even know what Smith's Pharmacy is or where it's at. But again, when she's folks, questioned. She was... So... Was she lying? Was she just too drugged? Whatever. Um, So this is the time period when she supposedly tries to get this. Eli Benz refuses to sell this to the person who comes to ask him uh, for the prussic acid because they don't have a prescription for this. And that requires a prescription. And he says, well, what are you going to use it for? And he is told that this person is going to use it to clean a seal uh, coat, Mm -hmm. a seal skin coat. He refuses to do this. He says that he doesn't know who this is. Other people in the store say it was Lizzie Borden. He says, I don't know who it is, but I could identify her in the future. Okay. That's kind of important to know. Uh, by the way, prussic acid is used to kill people. <laughs> I mean, a small... It's, it's a poison. It's a poison. It's a poison. Uh, it... Okay, so, and here's <laughs> another thing, too. If you haven't caught any of our other behind the hauntings, okay, in most cases, women back in the days would commit murder with arsenic or poison. Yes. Just by... And Abby already thought she was being poisoned. ...data of looking over the cases, a profile of a woman committing a murder. In most cases, it was poison. Right. Right. And Abby said, hey, I think we're being poisoned. Right. So it kind of just ties in there and people are like, wait a minute here. Um, But there were also other uses for prussic acid. uh, And people who were pregnant would sometimes use prussic acid um, for for the sicknesses. Yeah, to stop. Yeah, stop you from being sick sick and having morning sickness. So they were all throwing up all the time you know yeah, so maybe much of she it thought will kill you. yeah maybe she did and she just thought that she would you know help them out but she claims she did not do any such thing all right okay moving on so at noon lizzie is home and her and andrew and abby have dinner together they had noontime dinners so they would have their big meal at lunch and so or what we consider lunch today Afterwards, Lizzie goes upstairs, uh, and she doesn't know it. Uh, she knows it, but she doesn't see him. Uh, Uncle John Morse comes and visits. He gets there at about 1.30. She's already upstairs, and she never comes down to see him. I'm just going to tell you that if I had relatives that came over to my house, and I didn't go out and say hello to them, I would be in trouble. You know, I don't, I don't care if it's with my husband, with my mother, you know, you just, if somebody comes to visit, you go say at least hi, you know, she She did not do any such thing. So he's there. She doesn't come and say hi. From two to four, um, Andrew and John have a discussion when he gets there. They say, do you want something to eat? Abby goes, fixes him something to eat. Abby goes and fixes him something to eat, not Bridget. And then uh, he has some some food, and then they have this conversation, this discussion. Supposedly, Lizzie overhears this discussion. That's how she knows that Uncle John is there. She hears their voices. She hears and recognizes Uncle John's voice. So one thing that we didn't do that I wanted to do, and I forgot now, I just thought of it. Okay is the layout of the house, inside of the house. That actually is going to be in tomorrow's video. I wanted to put those in here and I forgot. But I'll just explain to you. The parlor area where Andrew was found, where this conversation would have took place, is directly underneath Lizzie's bedroom. Correct. So she would have heard this 
yes. conversation. And in fact, in her inquisition, she actually says that she closed her bedroom door because it was too loud and it was annoying her. So she tried to shut out some of the extra sound just by closing that the bedroom door, but she was still able to hear them. She did have that in her court uh, inquisition transcripts. Uh, at four o'clock, Uncle John then decides to leave. And he is not leaving for good. He's coming back, but he's going to go to the Swan, the visit the Swansea farm. And they kind of say, you know, okay, great, bring us back some eggs and, you know, stuff when you come back. Which the Swansea farm, by the way, was the Borden's farm and also their summer, summer house. Summer house. Yes. Where they would go there and spend the summers. I looked that up on Mm-hmm. Google Maps mm-hmm. of where it's located. Mm-hmm. It's actually privately owned. There's people who yes, live there now. Yes. But it's like in the. It's not like on a lake or on the water or whatever. It's like in the center. Yeah, of, it's not a water. It doesn't have any water. Yeah, uh, so I front don't know property. if the farm property did reach out to the water maybe at one time, like it was bigger. But right now it's it's like landlocked. Yeah, I know, it's kind of yeah. strange. Uh, a, they were actually thinking of selling the Swansea farm. Uh, and that is what supposedly this conversation that they had may have been about. John Morris wanted to move there, and Andrew was planning on he turning this over to to his wife, to Abby. To Abby. Um, he wanted to move there and, and basically run the farm, didn't he? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so they think that maybe that was what their conversation was a, a little bit about. And so it kind of gives the credence to why he was going to go to this farmhouse when he's coming back tonight. It's like the summer house. Why would you go there and not stay there? You know? Right. Uh, so anyhow, he goes at four o'clock to the Swansea farm. He doesn't return for several hours. Um, during this time period that he's out at the Swansea farm, Lizzie comes down from her bedroom and she goes out. She supposedly has been homesick all day, but she's feeling well enough to go out. Remember, she was trying to purchase prussic acid, they thought, earlier in the day. She claims she didn't. She was homesick, but she's well enough feeling to go out uh, in the evening. So at 7 o'clock, she goes and she visits Alice Russell, her friend. According to the transcripts of the trial from Alice, Alice says that in their conversation, she talks about fearing that something bad is going to happen. Someone's going to hurt them. Someone's going to, you know, do something uh, because father has so many enemies. And she is fearful that someone is going to come burn the house down around her as she sleeps. So she sleeps with one eye open and just terrifying uh, or showing that she's terrified to Alice Russell. She uh, is over there. Uncle John returns home about 845 and he goes in and has another conversation with Abby and Andrew in the sitting room. And uh, about nine o'clock, Lizzie returns home. She goes directly upstairs. She does not stop and say hi to Uncle John. Again. Again. So here she is coming in the front door, literally from the front door, straight ahead is the sitting room. She hears them talking. She doesn't go in. She goes straight upstairs. The sitting room is above the, or below the guest room where John Morris was staying. That's the sitting, the front room. Well, that one, they could have looked just to the left. Supposedly, it was in the room that Andrew was actually killed in. Same room. Same room. I'm wrong. The front room, the parlor was more of a, you know, fancy, dancy thing. Okay. Yeah. So by 10 p.m. So she goes directly upstairs. By 10 o'clock, everybody else in the house has gone upstairs, too. Abby goes upstairs uh, before Andrew. Um, So she goes up first, and then then, uh, John Morris goes up, and then Andrew goes up. And by 10 o'clock, everybody's in bed. Okay, so that brings us, or how are we doing? Do, or is anybody have any questions so far? Because now we're moving on to the day of the day uh, of, actual yeah. murders. All right, so we've got some people leaving. Thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you, Just Out and About. We'll see you around. All right. <clears throat> 
Sorry, folks. We're getting and through this. And Tracy hard says, day. I wondered if they thought they were being poisoned. So, yep, they sure did. Well, Abby, Abby, Abby did anyway. Abby thought strongly that she was being poisoned. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. So now we're moving on to the actual day of the crime. So what did she overhear that might have made her mad? That's the, the interesting. The idea, the the. the most common idea is that it was the land transfer. Yeah, it was something to do with Again. that farm. And it was supposed to go to Abby. And and here we go again. Five years ago, we went through this, and now you're starting it all again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, it was something about that. All right, so this is the day of. This is what happened. This is how it went down. All right, so here we go. Emma Borden was not home. She still wasn't home. She was away. Uh, she was still in Fairhaven. in Fairhaven. Yeah. All right. Now, this is where everything's going to get real detailed, and it's going to be, like, almost in some place, places minute by minute. Okay. So okay? we're going to go kind of fast yeah. through this. All right. So 6 o'clock, Uncle John gets up, and he goes downstairs to the dining room. He thinks he's the first one up, uh, so he goes and he sits then in the sitting room just to kind of wait for people to get up. Around 7 o'clock, Bridget comes downstairs. She makes breakfast. Between 7 and 8.30, they apparently are in the dining room having breakfast. They is John Morris. Uh, Morris is spelt wrong. It's Morse. Uh, Andrew Borden and Abby Borden. No Lizzie again. She doesn't even come down for breakfast with Uncle John. Okay. Uh, then John Morris leaves the house. I don't know how I spelled his name wrong twice. Uh, leaves the house at 8.45 uh, in the morning, and he goes out through the back door, so it's kind of off the kitchen. He does not go out the front door. Okay, That kind of becomes important later as well. 8.45, Lizzie comes down for breakfast. So Uncle John's already gone. Uncle she John walks out the back the door. Time. Yeah, Uncle John walks out the back door. Lizzie comes down the front stairs. Uh, she says in her trial transcripts that she comes down a few minutes before 9 uh, in, a, in one spot. And then so she says about quarter till. The whole time that Uncle John has been there, Lizzie or Emma have not said a word, seen him, talked to him. Right. Anything. Well, because Emma's time. yeah, because Emma's not there, but right. Lizzie. That's no. their uncle. Yeah, Lizzie does not go to visit him. Yeah. Okay. So then, um, around the same time, uh, Abby tells Bridget she's got to wash those windows, and she's like, "Oh, okay," you know. So about eight forty-five, nine o'clock, she goes and she's getting ready to do this, but she gets sick. So Bridget now is going to go outside and vomit. She also now is sick. Nine o'clock, Mr. Borden is going to leave. Uh, he's going to go out to do some work in town to go visit his, you know, properties and things like that. Abby is going to go up. She's going to clean the guest room. And Bridget is going to clean up the breakfast stuff. She's going to put away all that breakfast stuff. All right. 9.30 comes along. Lots of stuff is going to happen around 9.30. First of all, we have word that um, John Morse has actually arrived at his relative's house on Way Bossett Street. Then Mr. Borden is noted as having a conversation at the Union Savings Bank with someone named Abraham Hart. Bridget starts cleaning all those windows. And... At some point around 9.30, she has a conversation with Lizzie about whether she should lock the door or not. Um, this is the back door by the kitchen. Nobody has even gone in or out of the front door yet today. Lizzie then begins ironing some handkerchiefs in the dining room. Between 9.30 and 10 is what the time value is for the estimated death of Abby Borden. She, of course, has those hatchet blows to the head and uh, does not make it. Between 9.30 and 10.20, Bridget's outside cleaning the windows. She is seen talking to the Kellys next door, their maid. And she is seen um, during the time period uh, by Mrs. Churchill. Okay. 9.45, 
There's another individual who speaks with Andrew, this time at National Union Bank. This is the second bank he's at within a 10-minute time period or so. Um, he speaks to John Burrell there. 9.55, third bank of the day, First National Bank. Andrew's talking to somebody named Everett Cook. All right. All right, here we go. Here we go. 10.20. Bridget's going to come back in the house through the side door and begin washing the windows on the first floor. 10.30 to 10.40 uh, in the morning, sometime within that time period, Andrew Borden isn't feeling well enough. He decides he's going to come home. So he starts to head back home from town. He's seen on the way by several people saying he left this store, I saw him leave, whatever. Uh, and he's also seen by Mrs. Kelly, his next door neighbor, who sees him entering or trying to enter through the front door of the house at 1040. She noticed, knows that this is the time because she was on her way to her dentist appointment. Okay. He gets let in at this point by Bridget. Because he's fiddling with the lock, he can't get in. It turns out all three of the locks are, are bolted on the house. He has a key for one of them. One of those, sh the other ones shouldn't be locked during the day. It was only locked at night. Lizzie locked them that night before she went up to bed. Apparently, no one unlocked it because they can't figure out why it was locked. Now, Bridget hears... Uh, Lizzie at this time, according to the trial transcripts, laughing on the stairs while she's letting Mr. Borden in. So while Bridget's letting Mr. Borden in, she hears this cackling, this laughing from on the staircase. The staircase. And this on is important. The staircase. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, let me explain again. That staircase, well, explain for the first time because I didn't explain before. The front door, there's a staircase that leads up. If you've seen ghost, the ghost stories and folklore and stuff like that, you've seen these pictures. The staircase leads up, up at the top of the stairs, looking over is that get, I mean, is the from the room. second step, you could look over and Into see in that guest room. room. Mm -hmm. Once you get on that landing, there's a doorway that goes in the guest room and a doorway that goes into Lizzie's bedroom. Mm -hmm. So Lizzie has was heard by Bridget laughing because the front door was locked mm -hmm. but she could have very easily looked over and seen abby oh yeah very easily we and that's why I we did. have pictures that we put out there of looking from the staircase because mm -hmm. that's where she was standing when she laughed and the doors were locked. yes now lizzie claims in the court transcripts she did not do that she was in the kitchen when Andrew came back and then a few minutes later in the questioning she says yeah I was on the I was on the stairs and then they're like okay well you changed your ear your answer where were you and she's like oh yeah that's right I was in the kitchen and they go back and forth about this whether she was in the kitchen or on the on the landing several times yeah in the court transcript several times all right okay so 1040 to 1045 uh, Bridget is going to see Lizzie go into the dining room and speak to her father. Now, Lizzie says she doesn't see Bridget anymore, but whatever. Um, she sees him go in to speak to her father. Andrew then goes up to his bedroom, which he has to do that by going through the kitchen, up the back stairs, and into his room because the way that they have the house set up, the Mr. and Mrs. Borden have the back half of the second floor. Lizzie and Emma have the front half of the second floor along with the... Uh, guest room, and there's no path between them. There's there technically a, there is, is a door, but, but that door was locked, locked from yeah. both sides. Both sides, Mr. Yeah. Borden and Lizzie, both locked with extra locks. Yeah. Interesting things, too. Um, and then uh, Lizzie, uh, or he goes up to his bedroom, he d gets something, he comes back down, goes in the sitting room, he lays down on the sofa. At this time, Lizzie uh, starts ironing again so she starts her ironing of her handkerchiefs um, but turns out that the coals aren't hot enough for her um, to finish so she doesn't finish that Oop. and then Bridget uh, is supposedly washing the windows in the dining room at this time but Lizzie says that she does not see Bridget anymore after she lets father in. She doesn't see him 
at, or she doesn't see Bridget at all. And like, well, the house isn't that big. If if they walked past you, wouldn't you have been yeah, able to see? You, you know, you, you would. would. And if you she was inside see. washing the windows, you definitely would have yeah. saw somebody. Yeah. In there. All, all right. right. Ten forty-five. Lizzie's gonna ask Bridget if she's going out. Oh wait, I didn't see Bridget. <laughs> but she, uh, in her court transcripts, Bridget says she uh, asked me if I was going out. She even mentions to me about this sale at Sargent's. And so um, at this time, she also is supposed to mention to Bridget that there's some mysterious note that Abby got from a sick friend. Uh, Ten fifty. Uh, a man is seen taking pears from Mr. Borden's property by one of the neighbors. And then at 10.55, Bridget goes upstairs to lay down. Remember, she doesn't feel well. So she's been not outside in the heat, washing these windows. She's just not feeling well. She says, I'm going to go lay down before I fix lunch. So I'm just going to go lay down. Lizzie claims at this time that she... Uh, doesn't have hot enough coals to, to make her iron hot enough for her to iron her handkerchiefs. So she goes out to the barn. On her way, she picks up a few pears. She goes upstairs. She eats the pears in the second story of the barn. And she looks for lead for, for making sinkers for a fishing trip next week. 11.05. Lizzie is going to come back into the house. And she is going to see her father and yell to Bridget to come down that somebody had killed her father. Notice the time there is very short. 11.10, five minutes later, Lizzie's going to send Bridget across the street to get, Dr. Do to get Dr. Bowen. Five minutes. What are they doing for five minutes looking at this dead body? Like... Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So she sends him her across the street to get Dr. Bowen, but Dr. Bowen so is not there. I want to, I want to, okay. So this timeline there, you look at those times. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're talking, uh, what, within a 10, 15 minute time frame. One of the theories out there is that Lizzie took off all of her clothes, mm -hmm. was naked, mm -hmm. went up, killed him, went downstairs, cleaned up, put all the clothes on and all that other stuff in 15 minutes. According to the timeline of everything it's, that went place. It's difficult. That's difficult. She yeah. gotta be quick. Yeah. But Yeah. Okay. Uh okay. So now uh Dr. Bowen she comes back and says Dr. Bowen's not there. So at eleven thirteen, Lizzie says, You know where Alice Russell lives, right? Go get Alice. Go get her. So she sends Bridget out of the house a second time to go and go to get Alice Russell. At this time, Mrs. Churchill, another neighbor, sees Bridget leaving, sees Lizzie looks distressed from the window of the door. And so Lizzie, she calls to Lizzie to say, hey, is everything, you know, what's going on? Or, you know, basically, how's it going, neighbor? And she says, Mrs. Churchill, you have to come over. Um, father's dead. <laughs> So she goes over. Mrs. Churchill is now at the house. Between 1013 and 1014, Mrs. Churchill uh, hears that Mr. Borden is dead, and she goes again looking for a doctor. We know doctor, you know, is not home across the street, so let's find another doctor. As she's doing this, she runs into somebody named John Cunningham, and she tells him what's going on over at the Borden house and that, you know, he's basically been killed. There's some sort of major issue going on. He is then going to take it upon himself to call this into the police. No, no, nothing has happened as far as telling the police or calling the police or anything. Which, by the way, that's not in the timeline. What was happening in Fall River on on uh, August 4th. On this day. Folks, here's another little thing you want to jot down. On this particular day, where were all the police? At a picnic. They were having They were picnic. having their annual policeman's picnic. On August 4th. And so there was basically a skeleton crew of police in town. Everybody else was out at this picnic. Could and in that fact, be significant? 
as to why this took place on that day. Yeah. And in fact, Mrs. Borden, Abby, was supposed to be watching her niece, I believe it is, uh, on this particular day so that her parents could go to the picnic. Yeah. Okay. Let's but because going. she was sick, that got canceled. All right. Let's keep going. All right. So... How accurate is the timeline? This is based on the uh, trial transcripts and what um, people said in the trial, tr trial, and also on the documentation from uh, the police as far as their police logs. So, all um, the interviews, all the um, preliminary inquisition, all that other stuff. These time frames were, or these times were put together based on all everyone's testimony and like some of them like that one she said where she said it was 10 40 she knew because that's when she left to go and i think bridget said she knew it was that time she was upstairs because she heard the church mm -hmm. she heard the bells off, off at 11 so it's pretty close to being accurate mm -hmm. pretty close i mean it might be off a few minutes but you know. Yeah, actually, uh, the majority of the discrepancies in the timeline come from John Morse. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway. Ready? All right. So, yeah, eleven sixteen to eleven twenty. After the police have been contacted uh, by Mr. Cunningham, then Mrs. Churchill is going to make it to the Borden home again. Dr. Bowen is actually going to show up at his house in his carriage. His wife's going to come outside and say, you got to get across the street. He goes across the street uh, to the Borden home, checks in on things. John Cunningham takes it upon himself not only to call the police, but to start checking the house. So he decides to check the cellar, and he finds that it is securely locked. So at this time, they thought that an intruder could still be in the house. Okay, so Possibly. We, we need to say that Possibly. because Lizzie said somebody broke in and killed her father. So yeah. they're looking around for somebody to still be in the house. But by the way, Lizzie doesn't take it upon herself to go out of the house. She right. just stays in the kitchen. So right. if the killer's still in the house, yeah, you she's know. She's not that scared. Yeah, she's not that, that worried about it. All right, so then Dr. Bowen uh, looks at the body of Andrew and he says, I, we need a sheet. So Bridget is sent to get a sheet to cover uh, Andrew with. And at this time, he has a free minute alone with Lizzie. 11.20 comes along, and the first officer is going to appear at the Borden home. It's logged as being a arrival time of 11.20. And who is it? It's Officer George Allen. Dr. Bowen is going to meet him at the door. He is going to look in the door as Dr. Bowen is letting him in, and he's going to see Lizzie sitting there in the kitchen. And then um, we are also going to have John Moore say, this is when I left to return to the Borden house. This is the time that I left. All right. 1121, Officer Allen, Mrs. Churchill, and Alice Russell go in to see Mr. Borden's body. Up until this time, Alice Russell and Mrs. Churchill have been in the house, in the kitchen, one door away from Mr. Borden's body, but they have not gone in there. They haven't seen it. So this is the first time that they see this. Um, at 11.22, Allen, Officer Allen, is going to deputize a guy walking around outside named Charles Sawyer. He is going to then tell him, I want you to stand post at this door. Don't let anybody in. Which, by the way, okay, he just pulls a guy off the street and he deputizes him and says, nobody's supposed to come in here. Now, mind you, most of the police officers are off at the picnic, right. okay? The location of where this house was, where they live, was not a great area of town. It just it happened to be close to where Mr. Borden can walk to work. So this dude that they deputize, okay? He may or may not have been trustworthy yeah and he's like hey you guys want to see a murder come yes on in. come on in and i would be surprised if he wasn't charging people hey come in you gotta go check this out <laughs> yeah there's no true. documentation of him charging people no, but there is true. but there but there are <laughs> individuals who say he <laughs> let them in it's some dude he pulled off the street yeah yeah, yeah. interesting mm-hmm 
All right, so he deputizes Charles Sawyer. He, he leaves to go back to the police station to try to rally some additional help. Dr. Bowen then is going to go home again. He's going to leave. He's going to go and check the timetable. And he's going to try to get a message to Emma. He says that's what he's going to go do. That's why he's leaving. 11.23, Lizzie, Mrs. Churchill, and Alice Russell and Bridget apparently go and sit in the front parlor. So they had been in the kitchen. We can't go sit in the room with Mr. Borden. So let's go and we'll sit in the front parlor. Charles Sawyer then starts to let people in to see the body of I Mr. Borden. I just told you that. I know. What but did this you is, say that's not true? Oh, that he charged money. That he charged money. <laughs> yeah. So it's at this time when they've moved out of the kitchen and uh, he has now access to kind of be just bringing some peeps in. Come on in. This is when he does that. Come check this out. Yeah. Now, Dr. Well, Bowen. That's okay. Go. It doesn't matter. Dr. Bowen then is going to, uh, once he goes home and checks the rail timetable, he's going to go to Baker's Drug Store, and he's going to send this telegram to Emma saying, something's uh, come up, you need to come home. There's lots of words in the in the. Okay, so uh, let's just pause chat for a second. And see check what's out going chat. on in chat. Because we're seeing paragraphs come in. Yeah. All right, what do we got? Okay. All right. Andy, if, Andy, if on the educational level... If Bridget is the killer, was she smart enough to plan something like this on the day police were not fully staffed? Um, the more I hear, the more I think there were several people involved. Uh, I agree, multiple people were involved. I don't think Lizzie did it, but she knew it was going to happen and made sure uh, she was not in the house during it. Um, doesn't anybody wonder where Mrs. Borden is? Funny you should bring that up. All right, so let's they're keep going, going to They're going to ask here in a couple minutes. Yeah. So, oh, I didn't have it on us. Okay. Oh, you well, didn't have it no, on us? No, sorry. Oh, okay. That's okay. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, let's keep going. Okay. So, um, he's out sending this telegram to Emma saying she needs to come home. There's something wrong. She needs to get here as soon as she can. Uh, theoretically, in this, he tells her what rail car to take, etc. Lizzie, at this time, says... You know, I think I heard Mrs. Borden come back. All right, at I'm going to stop point. you just for a second, folks. Folks, she's doing this by memory, by the way. Yeah, you're seeing these bullet points, but she's this like, ah, she's got this all up here. I'm telling you, she scares me sometimes. Okay, <laughs> anyways, go ahead. <laughs> so, anyways, she. She has told people. <laughs> she has told people. I she, quit saying that. I know. Yeah, someday people gonna, are going to look at me. Going to get a report against you. I know. So they're going to come and say, are, "Are you sure your husband's okay?" <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, anyways, just to, just to reiterate, remember, she has told Bridget that Mrs. Borden is out. With she had a note that said she was going to visit somebody who was sick. Mr. Borden, when he had come home. She said the same thing. He, she yeah, had he a note. She was. Lizzie now says, you know, I think I may have heard her come back home. Somebody should go look for her. So Mrs. Churchill and Bridget say, okay. Actually, Bridget says, I'm not going to look alone. <laughs> you can't make me. You know? mm -hmm. Mrs. Churchill says, I'll go with you. So they go upstairs to look for Mrs. Borden. They start in the front half of the building. So they go up the front staircase, and when they get to just a couple steps from the top, they're looking left, and they can see right underneath the bed line, they can see Mrs. Borden's body lying there dead. So they find Mrs. Borden's body. Now, at 11.40 a.m., Dr. Bowen is going to return, and he is going to be told, hey, um, Upstairs, there's another one. He's like, there's another one? It's Mrs. Borden. Uh, so he goes up to check and says, yep, she's dead. Uh, at this time, also, Officers Doherty and uh, Sheriff Wixton, Wixon, I think it's Wixton, um, come and they start searching the house. They start searching to make sure that, you know, there's not somebody there, and they start looking for potential weaponry and things like that. At this time, Wixon and Dr. Bowen will actually go through 
Andrew Borden's pockets. And they're going to take out what was in his pockets, and they're also going to uh, take his watch. What do they do with it? I have no idea. <laughs> but they take, they, they take these things. All right. So then what's going to happen is, um, well, Dr. Bowen and, and Officer Doherty are upstairs checking on Abby's body, and they say, I need, what? I'm sorry, I wasn't, okay. Um, I wasn't looking. Uh, so anyways, they say, you know, this isn't good enough. I need to be able to see her body a little bit better. So they basically move the bed at this time. So it's 1135. They decide to move the body or move the um, bed so that they can get a better view of the body. 1135, um, between then and 1145, John Morse is actually going to arrive back at the Borden house. He's going to come in. He's going to go through the backyard area. He's going to pick some pears these people in their pairs. Uh, and he basically claims that he didn't notice anything unusual at the time. He didn't even notice or realize that anybody was there. So here he is. There's there's somebody guarding the door. There's people traipsing in and out. Oh, but I didn't notice anything. So that's where potentially his timeline starts to be a problem because he should have seen people. He should have seen things going on at this time. 11.45, the medical examiner comes. Remember, they've already moved stuff. <laughs> the medical examiner comes at 11.45 after they've already moved the bed. They've already turned Mrs. Borden over, checked her out. Um, not probably the wisest choices to do these things before the medical examiner gets there. But nonetheless, when the medical examiner gets there, um, he doesn't go around alone. John Morse says, hey, I'll come check out the bodies with you. So John Morse goes and checks out each of the bodies as well. So that's the correct way to spell Morse. Yes, M-O-R-S-E. Like yes, yes. Okay. Um, so 1150, uh, Marshall Fleet is going to arrive, and he's going to start to question Lizzie. It's at this time, 1150 in the morning, she becomes a suspect. Because she starts to insist that Abby is not her mother. Not, you know, oh, yeah, she, you know, I saw her, you know, I saw her this time and that time. When they ask about your mother, she's like, she is not my mother. She's not my mother. She's my stepmother. I'm like, oh, okay, you know. So they start to think something's kind yes. of. Yes. So then at, ele creepy. at 1225, another officer, Officer Harrington, is going to come up and question Lizzie as well because this guy's kind of like, dude, she's like freaking out that this is not her mother. <laughs> so she gets questioned again. All right. Now, the next thing that's going to happen is it's going to be about 3.30 in the oh, afternoon. Oh, here's where it starts really It's going to start to get, get good We need now. to throw a warning up here, folks. But, uh, yeah, it's going to start <laughs> getting really interesting. Uh, Angela's headed out for the night. She says it's very right, interesting, night. but she's got to go sleepy, sleepy. Uh, and so does Blue's Coins. All right, they can't well, stay awake. Hey, at this point, if you guys want to come back, we're about 156. You come back and catch the last part of this. Yeah. So about an hour and 56 minutes into it, yes. the two-hour mark, because this is going to start getting interesting. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. All right. So at 3.30 in the afternoon, a local photographer More shows up. His name is James, James Walsh. And he takes photographs of the crime scene. There's nothing documented. Nobody remembers who it was specifically who said we should get the guy down the street to come take pictures of this. But somebody uh, did. And he comes, he takes pictures. Well, he also has to move things around too because... He has to move some things around too because, you know, he's just not getting the angles he needs. Once he gets all these photos done, Abby's body is going to get brought down to the dining room. So they're going to bring her downstairs. At 3.40, Emma is going to leave, and she's going to uh, get on the materials, the trains, to come home. At 4 o'clock, they're going to have the first autopsies. I say the first autopsies because there will be a second autopsy uh, the day of the funeral. 
Anyway, uh, each of these victims is going to have the autopsy by the medical examiner, and during this time they're going to remove the stomachs, they're going to tie them off, they're going to seal them up, and they are going to send them for poison testing. They're going to do this um, to Dr. Wood at Harvard University. Um, typo. There's testing. Yes, yes. Okay. So they do this because there is that fear that they were poisoned. They're hacked up. Yeah. But yet, they're worried if they were really poisoned. Uh, Andrew's autopsy is done in the sitting room where he was killed. Abby is going to have hers in the dining room. So Abby's going to be uh, having her autopsy in the dining room, basically right there where they have their next meals. But anyway, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, Emma finally is going to arrive back at home. She's going to find her parents dead, um, get the lowdown on what's going on. At 5.30 in the afternoon, um, the undertaker, James Winward, is given access to the bodies. And it was Lizzie who specifically requested that James Winward be the undertaker that was chosen. Okay. Now, he testifies in court that he prepared the bodies, but there's question of whether that was true or whether it was really his employee named James Renwick who did that. So, did he do it? I don't know. Uh, at 5.35, the sofa is removed from the house as evidence and sent to Windwards for storage. So not only is he going to be the undertaker, he's going to be storing the, the couch too. So Now, all these officers, they got interrupted at their nice picnic and said they want some food. So they're going to go and have some dinner. After dinner, though, Officer Doherty and Sergeant Harrington are going to be sent out to investigate a suspicious character that just happened to have been seen. <laughs> See what Happy Trails put? He must have been a YouTuber getting the right angle. That's right. <laughs> That's right. You've got to have the best angles. Uh, anyhow, uh, while they're out doing this investigation of this suspicious character that has been seen, I think it was... Uh, it was on one of the other streets. Uh, it wasn't 2nd Street. Uh, anyhow, they went ahead and they hear about Lizzie's attempt to purchase prussic acid. So some of these people who were in the store, um, they're like, oh yeah, remember she was the one who was in there trying to get Eli Benz to sell, us, sell her some of this stuff. So they go and they question Eli Benz and they question other pharmacists in town as well. But they question him and he says, I don't know if it really is, is Lizzie Borden. I don't really know who she is. However, I could definitely tell it was her if I saw her again. So they bring her to the Borden house. Why not? Everybody else has been there today. So they bring him over between 815 and 830. They're going to bring Eli over to the Borden house to take a look at Lizzie and see if that's who tried to purchase that prussic acid. Just as a historical note, sunset that night was at 6.68 p.m. It was They did not have daylight savings time at that time, so it is starting to get a little bit darker. It's not like pitch black out, but, you know, the time has come that it's starting to, you know, get a little bit dark. And remember, we don't have electricity in the Borden house. Right. We have kerosene lamps. So he's going to try to identify her with a kerosene lamp as the light. 845, Officer Hyde is going to be stationed outside of the house for the night, and he sees Lizzie and Alice go into the basement through a window. He's able to see them go down into the basement. Now, in the trial transcripts, Alice says that they went down to empty um, their chamber pots into the privy. Nine o'clock, however, Officer Hyde sees someone going down in the basement again. This time it's Lizzie by herself, all alone. So within 15 minutes, she has gone down into the basement twice, once completely on her own. And then it's bedtime. Uh, bedtime. Where will they sleep? Well, let's look at it this way. We're going to have several people staying in the house. The dead bodies are in the kitchen on the table. In the kitchen? I mean, I'm sorry, in the dining room on the table. They're just going to stay there for the night. So who's going to stay? Well, Emma has made it home, so she's going to stay in the house. Of course, Lizzie's there. She's not leaving. Uncle John is here. He's going to spend the night, too. 
there is question as to whether he slept in the room where Abby was found murdered or not. Initial reports said that he did. Other reports now say that he stayed up in the attic uh, in one of the uh, rooms that is now named after the lawyers. Um, and then we have uh, our friend Alice Russell. Alice says, I will stay here with you. She stays in Mr. and Mrs. Borden's bedroom. So we have her and Mrs. And Mr. Borden's bedroom. We've got Lizzie in her room, Emma in her room, John Morris, either in the room where Abby was killed or upstairs, not sure, um, but not Bridget. In the bodies in the dining room. Yeah. The bodies are in the... Yeah. Because the funeral was in the house. Yeah. But Bridget says, no way, I'm not staying in this house. She goes across the street and she stays with a friend uh, in, in, and she does not stay in the house. She's like, you guys are crazy. I'm not staying here with those dead bodies. There's somebody came in here and killed people today. What is wrong with you people? So um, anyhow, that is the day. That's the, well, the few days around the case. So... Let's move on okay. and talk about our theory. Okay. Now, so far, folks that are still in here, what do you think? Do you think Lizzie still did it? Do you think she was a part of it? Do you think all of them were a part of it? Do you think it was a conspiracy? I always say, follow the money. Who's going to benefit from this? I don't think it was a crime of passion. I really don't. Yeah, there were, they say crimes of passion or you're going to have all those extra wax, yeah. but... I don't think it was a crime of passion. I don't think it was a revenge type thing. I don't think it was for power. The psychological thing, if it was Lizzie, it could be psychological. <laughs> it's possible. I think it was for the money. Now, we have dug and searched and dug and dug and dug to see if Uncle John, Bridget, Dr. Bowen, any of those benefited in some way financially from the Borden sisters after the fact. And we can't find that anywhere. But that could be something that happened that wasn't documented. So let's talk about our theory and see what you guys think. Okay? And all these things popped up. All right. So here is our theory. They think several people. Yeah. Yeah. Our theory is this. We think the father, you know, Andrew was aging. He's getting older. He's working on his will because he was 69 when this happened. He was getting ready to turn 70. The girls were getting worried that they would be left out with very little. Like, hit all of his money is going to be given away. And he's fearful that the girls aren't going to let Abby live in the house anymore once he's gone. Right. Because they don't like her. <laughs> so here's one thing that's kind of important, too. Andrew Borden didn't have a will. Or he it had a never will. never been found. And there were papers, papers that were burnt. Now, according to Massachusetts law, with no will, okay, the estate would go to the wife and her family if she died after he did. Okay? It is known that she died first. So it didn't go to her and her, her family. Mm -hmm. If it was the opposite way around, the Borden sisters would have got goose egg. They would have been. Yeah. So if she would have died after Andrew without a will, yeah, just need to. And mention how that. they how they know when when she died, um, and versus when Mr. Borden died, uh, was first and foremost by the blood clotting. So Mr. Borden was still dripping when when people came in. Mrs. Borden had started to congeal. Her yeah. blood had started so they to congeal. Know that she went and they also had sent the stomach contents off for studies. And uh, it showed clearly that there had been more digestion that had happened on 
uh, Mr. Borden than on Abby. Okay, so we think that Lizzie did attempt this. She attempted it, but it failed. Okay, like she was trying to knock him off through poisoning, but it either wasn't enough or, you know, she didn't quite pull it off because that's why she was trying to get the prussic acid, prussic acid. Yeah. to kind of like do it a little bit more. But then she was just having issues. She couldn't yeah. actually pull it off. Right. Unfortunately, when they did, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know which way you want to look at it. When they uh, went ahead and did the, the stomach contents testing, they did not find any prussic acid in their stomach contents at all. Neither did they find any other poisons in their system. So it was probably just summer sickness. Yeah. Was it really, did she, she really do it or not? Did she get really get them poisoned? Maybe she left stuff out longer than it should have been. I don't know. So what we, what we think is Lizzie organized this and planned this out. And like she put it together and said, Hey, look, father's getting old. He's had a great life, but we got to do something or we're going to lose out everything. Abby's going to get it all. Her family and descend, like her side of the family is going to get everything. Which, hey, that also means Uncle John. Yeah. Uncle John's left out of the picture too because that's Andrew's first what fight that family. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Now you you have there that um, it was to look like a break in or a copycat. Um, remember, for the or for those of you who don't know. A few weeks before, there, you know, there were some break-ins. Yeah, and actually, the Borden's house and barn was broken into. Yes, and uh, Miss Russell supposedly, allegedly well, broken Ms., into. Yes, Mrs. Miss Russell actually, in her court testimony, tells about how Lizzie said there were all these break-ins at the house. So um, it's in court transcript that they happened. Whether Lizzie lied or not is a different story. We do know that for sure the house was broken into at least once and the police were actually called in to investigate it. And then when they kind of said, I think it's Lizzie, you know, uh, Mr. Borden had the charge. Just close the case. I don't want to have anything to do so with it. So if you looked at any of the pictures that w- that we put out there too, there was a picture of a fireplace mantle that had a key laying on it. So the last most recent break-in, Andrew had enough and he locked all the doors and he took that key and stuck it on the mantle. And that was like he was telling Lizzie, I know it was you. Go ahead and take that key and try to unlock these doors. And that that they have that key sitting mm-hmm. on the manual, mantle because of that. Um, and it is documented that Abby had stuff, jewelry and stuff that was taken from her. Right. Jewelry, money. Yeah. There they were went some specifically car, into the house tickets. to her jewelry box and specifically stole stuff from her which totally ticked off andrew because he knew it was lizzie yeah he he suspected suspected her so that's why the doors were all locked and and kind of weird all right so the next thing we we think okay we think it was we think it was uncle john i think it was uncle john i mean he was a butcher he showed up out of the blue i think lizzie's got a hold of uncle john say hey i need your help now see, we'll that's where sure we that disagree. Get, yeah, this is yeah. where we disagree. I think he was. I think he was involved in it. I don't think he did the deed. Um, there's there's suspicions that he was having a, a a little affair with Bridget the maid, which would be kind of why he would she would help out, you know, because she they weren't really close with Bridget in the household. So mm. why would she help Lizzie? You know, well maybe it was because she was you know seeing Uncle John, um, but. Uh, he 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 was he was away visiting relatives. Relatives said Allegedly. he was there. Relatives say he was there. I don't know, but he definitely came into town. And I think well, my argument is yeah. he was a butcher. Yes, so he could have pulled this off, and Absolutely. it wouldn't affect him either way. I, mean, I he's agree a with you on that. Okay, and not being sexist, he's a male. Okay, he could have just done this, boom, 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 and not been stressed out. Or, you know, physically. Okay. I think Lizzie would have had a, a hard time doing that with family members that she lives with. Unless it was a crime of rage of passion or something. I mean, come on. <laughs> Sunday school teacher, whatever. Okay, this now guy you didn't sound, live in Now you house. sound like her jury. He showed up unannounced. 
he had this land dealings going on with the, the farm, okay? I think Lizzie said, hey, Uncle John, take care of this for me. Do this. He slipped into the door, you know, did it, left, went back out, and that alibi of where he was at, so it didn't, you know, point back to him. And uh, he got some financial benefit from Lizzie after everything calmed down. I truly believe yeah. that's what went down. And, if and I you, get that feeling. I mean, even when we watch certain shows, I'm like, mm-hmm. yep, that's yeah. who did it. Yep, that's who did it. Just that feeling. Mm-hmm. And laying there in that bed, staring at that picture, man, I'm telling you, like, here, here's the dude who did it. But that's just, that's that's yeah. my theory. So remember, his time period may have been off a little bit, too. Remember, um, he said he came back and he didn't see any commotion going on at the house. Yeah. And he saw, stopped and grabbed some pears. There was that report of someone. So what, am I swaying you over? To no, I'm just okay. saying there was there was the report of some man <laughs> stealing <sighs> pears from their Borden property, you know. Yeah. Around the time of the murders, okay. could it have been him? Is that why he didn't see anybody else? Yeah. Well, I think Bridget was involved too. I think mm-hmm. she was a lookout. She kept the neighbors occupied while Uncle John slipped in the back. Yeah, she was busy running in and out of the house a lot. and Then after trial was over, she left. She went to Montana. She could have just got a cash payoff saying, here, help us out, blah, blah, blah. And, right. and I, think that, I think that Bridget and also um, Dr. Bowen had plenty of opportunities to take evidence out of that house that morning. Yeah. Let's protect Lizzie. How did let's Dr. Protect Lizzie. Bowen benefit from that? I don't know. Was there yeah. something going on between him and Lizzie? That is the only possibility, I right? Know. I also think nothing happened afterwards with them, though. He I did have a think, wife. Uh, I also think Emma kind of knew about it. That's why she stayed away. I don't want to be involved with it. Whatever's going to happen, happens. Whatever, but I'm going away. And and I'm I'm at the the road where that may have been, or that may not have been. She may not have known anything. Lizzie and the others maybe would have used that to their advantage that she wasn't around because she wouldn't go through with it. She wouldn't approve of it. Right. Um, She would have stopped. And that maybe, maybe, just maybe, that was what happened in 1905. Did she find out the truth? And is that what said, said, I'm done with you, Lizzie. Yeah, but she did get half the money. She did. She did. All right, like we just said, Dr. Bowen, he had to be involved somehow. Somehow he had to know what was going on. At some point, he was seen uh, burning something in in the kitchen uh, that had Emma's name on it. Yeah. So, and then a question again. Did any of the others, except for Lizzie and Emma, benefit financially? Don't know. We can't find anything, anything that's documented about that about transfers of property or anything Mm -hmm. like that but it could have stayed in in their names and just go ahead and go over there Mm -hmm. or here's some cash or whatever i don't know anyways that's my theory i think lizzie planned it she had uncle morris come take care of the deed and she was like oh somebody broke in and then they nailed her because she was there and she kept tripping up her story. And that's why they took it to the grand jury. And they said, I think there's enough evidence for you to go to trial. She went to trial. Dr. Bowen kept her, kept her drugged up. And there were certain things during the trial, which we're going to talk about that in, in uh, uh, another video. Actually, the interview video. Things that weren't thrown out and not admissible during the trial. But then she was acquitted from it. And then it's like an open case. Here's two people that were brutally murdered. I personally think that Lizzie could have done it. She probably had other helpers. I think she planned it. I think she could have done it. The whole idea that, you know, this little Sunday school teacher couldn't have, you know, chopped them up with the hatchet. I am Lizzie's size. I could do it. Physically, I could do it. Just saying. I don't think you could do it. Oh, I I could do it. 19 to the stepmother and 10 to your father? I don't know. I'm just saying You're not that. I'm just saying that crazy. Physic, I'm just saying that physically <clears throat> I could do it. I don't know. 
Hey, let's go in the chat. Let's see, let's what, see what they saying. think. Let's go to the chat because we got some questions for you guys. All right. All right. We see kind of telling to remain. The house sort of illustrates intense position. The house is not mine, etc. Yeah, it's true. I love that Bridget uh, Kohler says, it wasn't me. <laughs> so Tracy is asking, do you know if the half-brother come into the money afterwards? So here's here's the thing. The trial took a year. Was it a year after? The uh, she went to trial June 5th of 1893. And, uh, so it was almost a year. It was almost a year later so when she went to later. trial. So there's there's no documentation like after the trial okay so after the trial was over and he did not get anything everything was from settled the estate yeah he didn't get anything from the state but it did take a while for them to get the money because you know here she's on trial mm -hmm. now they did have money the girls did have their own money yes that they lived off of until they got the inheritance yes. because they did own properties that their father gave them. Well, okay. he had he had actually paid them to get the ferry house back. He paid them $5,000 yeah. just so about a had, month before. They had money to live off of. Um, so after the trial was over... There's not much documentation after after the fact, like who got what and that kind of thing. There is a there is there are wills uh, for Lizzie and Emma, mm -hmm. and uh, Lizzie left most of her money to like charitable organizations and things like that. And you know they did come together. They did spend money for a monument for their father. Yeah, and it was, it was very expensive. Like, yeah. 2500 just for the monument. Yeah. And in their wills, each one of them left, left money, money to take to care of the lots. Take care and of it. And by the way, and we're going to talk about this later, is their mother there at the family plot? Mm -hmm. Okay. So their mother, Sarah. They had another sibling that passed Alice when when she was really young. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lizzie or Lisbeth, Emma, Andrew, and Abby are all buried in the together. same family plot together in mm -hmm. uh, Oak Grove Cemetery. So that's that's kind of interesting. So we have some questions for you guys. Irish, while well, you're pulling those up, Irish Whiskey says, I don't think Lizzie would have been strong enough to do all that herself. See, that's what I'm saying. We're talking... We're talking almost 20 swings of the axe for the mother, and then an hour later... Keep your composure when your father comes home, like you're not all disheveled, and then tend to him. I'm just saying. And and these people were like malnutrition because they're eating all this crap, and Lizzie's not eating it. She's sneaking out back living off of pears. <laughs> I'm just saying. I don't know that I could do it. Just the strength, the, the stamina. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. Okay, so here's some questions for you guys. All right, question number one. Did your opinion change after our presentation? Did you change your mind? Do you think... Uh, most of them yeah. said she was guilty. She right. did it. But do you think she that maybe had she had help now? Help? Did you say, you know what? I like one of those other characters better. What say you? Leave it in the chat. Happy Trails Hiking says, Iowa girls are tough. Uh, she was from Massachusetts, but, you know, it's all good. Massachusetts girl can so Shotgun girl says maybe. yes. Opinions changed. Laura, girl, not really. Andrew says, hatchets don't weigh that much. It's easy to swing. PSPR, Lizzie did it with or without help. Okay. Uh, Laura, not really. Her opinion really did not change. Okay. Anybody else? All right, so the next question we have 
Who do you think benefited from the crime? Who benefited the most from the crime? Well, that's kind of like a dumb question because we know who benefited from the crime. The girls got the money. But do you think anybody else would have benefited? Perhaps someone who had a land dealing that wasn't going to go their way. Maybe that uh, Lizzie would or Emma would allow them to be in the facility or use one of the properties where Andrew said no. See, there's so many different theories as what happened. If we go with what Lizzie said... For revenge, somebody could have broke in and did it. But why wasn't there some break in? How did they slip in? How did they do it without a mess everywhere? That many hacks. And not to get graphic, but that would have been a mess. You know, just the axe coming in and coming out, going in and coming out, would have the whole room would have just been splattered everywhere. And it wasn't. That's what's weird. Mm -hmm. What I find weird is that Andrew would have rolled up his jacket and stuck it under his head. Yeah. Uh, and and under the pillow, you know, on the on the couch. It's his favorite coat. He wears this coat all the time. Are you just going to roll it up in a ball and un use it as a pillow? Here's another theory that I didn't put in there. Okay. What if? All these people that were at that house was involved. And it didn't happen in those locations. They put them in those locations and they came up with that timeline. There's a theory right there. Well, there, the I was going to say that as far as the, the jacket goes, as far as the jacket goes, um, Lizzie wanted it cleaned immediately. There's the theory that she did this and she did it while naked. I say she was wearing his coat. She took his coat, put it on. That's why there was blood on the coat. Why there wasn't blood found on her. But what about Abby? Well, she had time to get cleaned up. True. Wonder Pup says, thinks it's the uncle now. All right, so here's the next question. <laughs> I kind of asked this in the chat, though, already. Yeah, you already asked this. Would you have stayed in that house that night? Would you have stayed there? Knowing what went down... That day. That day, and the bodies still being in that house. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I had a little bit of trouble staying there <laughs> when we were there. I mean, just kind of being a little creeped out I, I was kind of like i didn't want to really go to sleep it was just kind of freaky i didn't want to sleep because i didn't want to miss anything yeah but i eventually fell asleep but i didn't want to miss anything like i was staying in the lizzie borden house you know i tell you what if i would have known all the paranormal claims and all those reports and everything before we went i wouldn't have slept i wouldn't have slept i took a shower in that shower where it's reported that Lizzie walked out of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As I, a ghost, by the way. Yeah. I wouldn't, it I used wouldn't to be have closet. slept. Not that I would have been freaked out about it. I wouldn't have slept because I would have been like, okay, let's go. we got to catch something. Okay, let's go over here. You know, let's do that. That type of thing. I, I, I was, the adrenaline would have been rushing, you know. Okay. So, uh... We have Shot Girl says nope. Wonder Pup says nope. Tracy says nope. Laura says I don't know. And then there's Andrew. Sure, they sure. weren't getting they ripe weren't getting yet. Right. You know, it's only like probably 80 degrees or so in the house in, you know, August. Yeah, they're not gamey yet. You know, it's just, you know, it's a, it, it, give it a couple days. It'll be okay. You know, but I will say that. I would stay in the house. I think I could stay in the house. But I definitely wouldn't be going dumping the slop pails in the basement in the middle of the night as I walk down, the, down knowing I like, walk just past the dead bodies and go into the basement and hang out. No, I'm not going to hang out in the so basement. So FS Paranormal says, I know funerals back in the homes uh, were in the homes. They would have flowers. Yes, you're right. Um, and people needed time to travel for the whole fair. That's why they had wakes. 
wakes in the houses, mm-hmm. number one was to make sure that the body, like they were that dead. they were dead. In this in case, this case, we know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the extended wake time would to allow others to travel in. Right. In this case, there wasn't that problem because they were prominent and most of their relatives were there in Fall River. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, the funeral was rather quick. It was rather quick, yeah. But like Marianne said, and we're going to cover this when we cover the cemetery, there was a second autopsy done. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they were moved to the cemetery, more things were done with the bodies, which was quite interesting. It's good. It's real good. Yeah. All right, so uh, before I ask you guys if you have any questions of us, I'd just like to uh, say something. When this is done processing, because we want to keep it out there as an archive documentation type thing, if you could please come back to this video when it's done, or tomorrow or whenever, just come back, leave a comment in the video, and let us know if you like these formats. Let us know if you want us to do more of these in the future, these Behind the Hauntings. This is number four. This is the this is the big one, the Lizzie Borden case, um, but there are others that we can do. Like we were talking about the uh, John Burns, mm-hmm. and others and things like that. Won't be as intense and and in, in detailed as this, but not minute still by this, minute. This format where we <laughs> kind of present what went down in the haunting and we talk about it and discuss it and that kind of stuff on a live stream. If you like this format. Please come back and leave that in the comments. We have now 31 thumbs up. So I'm assuming that people like this format. This is number four so far. They've been good. Mm -hmm. So that kind of wraps up our presentation. If you guys have any questions at all about the Lizzie Borden case, now's the time to ask the expert right here. She (laughs) could probably tell you just about anything about the lizzie borden case if you have any questions while we're waiting for them to do that in in all of our other behind the hauntings we did you know kind of talk about which ghosts were still at the location and why you know we could talk about so you guys want to talk about the the big one actual hauntings that are the big one uh, that is thought to be there is mr borden andrew andrew's seen there a lot and then lizzie is sometimes seen there but Andrew is a big in, and then there's some children. Yeah. Well, a- it would make sense, Andrew. He loved this building. He did. He loved the house. And he was brutally murdered in this house. Yeah. Um, there are several spirits reported in this house, not just the Bordens. Um, and actually, we got another video coming out. There were deaths in the house before the Bordens bought the house. Mm-hmm. Um and then people owned it over the years, and then the children uh, that's reported in the attic, they actually died on a property adjacent to this house. And they're possibly. Said, possibly because they have different because they've apparently given different names than the names of the kids that died yeah. on the adjacent property. But that's the that's who they thought it was was the children from the adjacent property. What more do you know about the brother? Where was he during the murders? Uh, in Fall River, apparently. Um, but as far as um, much more about him, uh, I know he had a wife. Um, and he had several siblings. I know that his mother was married at the time that uh, he was born. I know that within a year after he was born, his mother died. Uh, but he did, uh, get a new mommy because, uh, his father remarried again, which happened a lot. It did. It did. But he married her within four months of the death of the mother. Oh, you can't let the kids go unattended. Yeah, I guess not. <laughs> That's why especially they remarried the, so quickly. Especially with uh, someone so young. Um, well, whatever. Uh, so a- as far as he goes, uh, there was some um, plan or, or, or reports that he may have gone into uh, a psychiatric facility at one point, but I don't have like 100% documented truth on that. 
but I do know that he hung himself. That was how he died. Uh, I have seen his uh, a certificate saying, Death you know, uh, that he died by hanging, who his parents were, you know, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so Wonder Pup Adventures is, is asking, where is the house located, what state? It is in Fall River, Massachusetts. Yes. And actually... Um, it's about a half hour to an hour away from Providence, Rhode Island. Yeah, and our video tomorrow will actually give you the actual address and the Panic D page and all that other stuff that will show you demographics of where it's actually located. We visited in 2015. 15, I think. November of 2015, we spent the night there. Yeah. Um, so we have a couple of questions in there about the hatchet. I know what I was asking them. Okay. Was the ha hatchet sharp or dull? It was. It was sharp, and they know it was a hatchet because they lined up the marks, the size of the marks with the indentions on the skull and and the clothing, clothing on Abby and things like that. And it was so it was sharp that it it cut through Abby's clothing clean. Mm -hmm. like a clean cut yeah so they knew it was sharp that's a good question though because yeah. if it if it wasn't sharp it would have ripped the clothing but this was a sharp like scissors cutting through so they were yeah. very sharp yeah so um when he mentioned that i should have probably mentioned uh abby had 19 hatchet wounds and one of them was to her back and the rest were to her head so the one that was on her back that's the cloth that they matched up the the thing for was that hatchet ever found good question <clears throat> did they release that yet they were supposed to be releasing something at the fall river historical society that were records that were was it the prosecutor or the or her her attorney uh, sealed well there's some of both okay uh so there is a hatchet blade at the Fall River Historical Society that they claim was the Lizzie Borden a uh, hatchet axe um, that was used at the trial as evidence. Was that the hatchet? Don't know. Uh, there was actually um, about a week before Lizzie's trial started there was a neighbor behind their house who was uh, doing some some things and some kids found a hatchet in the gutter of their house L like the backyard neighbor from the Bordens and like they're somebody like chucked that up on the where'd roof of a that house? come from and so he thought well maybe it was you know a, this I had some work done on my house. Maybe they left it here. You know, when I had work done on the house, they contacted um, the police and said, you know, we have this. And they said, we'll bring it to it. bring it. And they were like, well, I'm not going to come all the way down there to bring that. You come get it if you want it. And then somewhere in the meantime, a uh, worker came and, and collected it, said it was his and he took it. Um, but it was never tested. They, we don't know anything about that particular hatchet, nor do we know where it is today. You know, this person came along and took it and just disappeared into thin yeah. air. Um, there like were I, like several hatchets found in the in the house. Yeah, like I mentioned, there were several hatchets found, and back there, you know, back then in 1892, they didn't have luminol testing, and you know. They, they knew there was blood on it, but it could have been chickens, it could have been hens, it could have been pigeons. The pigeons were actually killed with a hatchet. Um, you know, they didn't know whether it was human or animal or, you know. So, yeah. Doctor, was the actual murder weapon? Yeah. Who really knows? Dr. Wood, um, he did do some analyzation of some of the blood, and he said that... Um, most of it, uh, there, none of them on the hatchets were human, uh, but there was um, a blood spot on something else that was human. So FS Paranormal says, the tale of Lizzie's great uncle, Ladrick, uh, also known as Ludwig. Uh, we covered that in, was that yesterday's video? I when did we do the blood? I didn't watch yesterday's video. No, your, when you did the. Oh, the bloodline? 
That was, I think, yesterday. I think it might have been yesterday. She talked about that. And there's yeah. an, actually another one that was generations before that, yeah, too. Seven so was, yeah, seven generations back from Lizzie, there was another another one uh, where there was murder in the Borden bloodline. Um, and um, then, of course, there was Uncle Ladwick. Uh, his wife was accused and, you know, it said, you know, she killed her two children and then herself, although... You know, if you those look at the, it, it could have been Uncle Lad. That story that you're talking about, those children are the ones that they think are in the attic of yes. the Lizzie Borden house. Yeah. The, the spirits of those yes. children. Uh, at the time, Uncle Ladwick owned that house and he owned the property that the Lizzie Borden house now sits on. That whole area was all his property. Yeah, so. Ladrick Borden originally owned that, that property. Right. Yeah. Yes. All right. Um sent some info about another family member drama oh there's lots of drama in the family <laughs> yeah if you go back how many generations before that was the other one seven seven generations so mm -hmm. marianne like found other murders in the family besides the ladrick the ladwick story there's another one yeah thomas in cornell the family too of murders yeah thomas cornell was accused of killing his mother uh rebecca briggs and um, she supposedly came back in a dream to her brother, John. And brother John then went to the police and said, you know, my, my dead sister came back in a dream to me and said, maybe we should check on this, you know, murder. Maybe, maybe she didn't die just accidentally in this fire. And they ended up finding a puncture wound in her, in her abdomen, in her stomach area. And he he hanged for the crime. Yeah, he did. Um, he had a child um, that was born after he died. His wife named it innocent because she said that her husband was innocent of these crimes, and she innocent ends up marrying a Borden, and that's how she becomes part of the Borden line. Uh, so you have three of those potential murders in the family in the bloodline if uncle lad did the deed instead of his his wife um eliza um yeah could be something in their blood but at the time of lizzie's trial they did look into uncle ladwick's wife uh and the murders that she did and they uh said oh well Lizzie can't be crazy, like, because it's in the bloodline, because she wasn't even a Borden. She was married into the Borden family. But if Uncle Ladwick did it, then that is in the Borden bloodline, you know? Yeah. So Iris Risky saying a super sharp hat hatchet would require less strength to inflict damage. Yeah. That's a good point. Absolutely. Good point, but I don't know. 29 wax with a hatchet total 29 oh easy peasy. no problem easy peasy wow wow <laughs> wow easy peasy all right so, folks so hey when this is done processing or tomorrow or whatever uh if you want to come back and let us know if you like these formats and want us to do more we have been live now for two hours and 42, 43 minutes. I think it's time that we wrap things up because I have to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> I need to take a nap. And I got a video I got to finish tonight yet. So we got a video coming out in the morning. Yep. And we're back live Saturday, Saturday at, at 5 o'clock. Live at 5, and what we're going to be covering is more of the reported paranormal claims at the house. Mm -hmm. That weren't in the ghost stories and folklore. We'll probably bring up a couple of those. Are we giving those, away but... the Lizzie dust, yeah. this one? We're giving away some Lizzie brick dust. So That will be the giveaway that we will bring up giveaway. this week. And uh, we got another announcement to make. There's something coming up, but we'll leave that for Saturday. If you guys come and join us and find out and all that other stuff. So... We like to thank you all very much for joining in on this Behind the Haunting. Yes. 
But you, she look, she still got a smile I, on her I face. Am. She I, loves this case. I do. I love this case so much. All righty. So hey, <laughs> hope you guys had a good time. Are you ready? You got anything else you'd like to add there? There. Thanks for being awesome. It was their first view, and they will be back. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, just that there's so much more to this. Stay tuned. This is we literally more the tip of out. the iceberg. This kind of tells you what happened. There's yeah. still more. Yeah. So much more. Yes. And so many more things that came out in the trial or didn't come out in the trial and things that happened afterwards. Not only did they find that hatchet later around the time of the trial, there was something else that happened around the time of the trial, too. Yeah. So, hey, stay tuned, right? Yeah. Will y'all ever go back? Absolutely. Yes. I want to go back Absolutely. right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll go back. Definitely. I would go back in a heartbeat. Actually, we've already plotted out a trip to go not only to the Lizzie Borden house, Maplecroft, and the cemetery, which we've been to, but also to the family the, the farm, farm. Swansea Farm. And the house in Fairhaven where Emma was at, mm -hmm. which, by the way, was for sale. Really? And it almost looks like the Lizzie Borden house. Really? Kind of interesting. interesting. I found that online. I got it pocketed. Nice. And then it's not that far from Salem, Massachusetts. Right. So we could fly into Boston, rent a car, drive an hour south, be in Fall River, go back up to Boston, an hour north of Salem, Massachusetts. Already got it plotted out. Just don't know when it would happen. But. Yeah. I'd like to throw in a couple of other locations, too, along the way, like some of the properties that Mr. Borden had or... Um, some because he had some industry buildings that he owned as well. So I I'd like go to go to see those. The, definitely because they've got stuff there. We weren't able to make it there last time. Yeah. It was closed when we were there. We were only there a short time, uh, like one one day basically, uh, and uh, they were closed at the time, so we weren't able to get in there. I definitely want to go in there because they've got the stuff. You know? yeah. <laughs> they have you know the braid from abby borden that kind of got chopped off wait till you see saturday's and... ebay purchase <laughs> you guys are gonna go what <laughs> wait till you see it this one is sitting right next yeah. to me <laughs> yeah leave it for saturday <laughs> okay all right folks hey we're gonna wrap it up so until next time thanks for watching and happy hunting if you like this episode of behind the haunting make sure you hit that like button and leave us a comment below. Also, if you'd like to see more videos from Hannick D videos in the future, make sure you subscribe and ding that bell so you get notified the next time we post a video or go live.